California, the Golden State, a state with pockets of vast wealth, economic growth, and a robust social safety net, but also the highest poverty rate in the nation. That's why the Cato Project on Poverty and Inequality in California is trying to find innovative solutions to this ongoing crisis. And welcome to all of our friends from California and across the country. I know we have people tuning in from uh, everywhere in the U.S. And indeed, our friends from around the world. We have people watching this from several countries as well. So I want to thank you all for tuning in today. We have a very important conference today on after COVID, building an inclusive economy for California. Uh, we are finally seeing a light at the end of the tunnel in the pan COVID pandemic. And as we begin to recover, we want to ensure that that recovery is equitable and that it is uh, something that all Californians can participate in. And speaking of participation, we would like you to participate in the discussion for this event. Uh, you can submit your questions on Twitter if you're watching us through Twitter. Uh, you can use the hashtag Cato California. Uh, if you're on Facebook Live or YouTube or the Cato event platform, you can simply use the, uh, the normal uh, question uh, issues that are provided for you there. And of course, there's a special place on the platform if you turn it into the official event, uh, event platform. So there's lots of ways you can be part of this, and we hope you will ask your questions of our speakers as we move forward. Uh, and then, of course, I also want to mention that after some of the panels Today, we're going to have special breakout rooms where you can keep the discussion going. So we hope you'll be an active participant uh, rather than just sort of watching this in the background. We really need your input, your ideas, and your questions to make this a success. So thank you very much for that. Uh, California's in an interesting position. Uh, certainly, even before the pandemic, it was a state, as we mentioned in the introduction, that it was experiencing solid economic growth. Uh, in the five years before the pandemic hit, uh, the average economic growth was 5.8%, which is, which is quite reasonable. But even then, there were signs of trouble. Uh, CNBC, in its annual uh, index of top states for business, ranks California as 32nd uh, in the nation, which I guess is okay, but certainly nothing to be particularly proud of. And Forbes ranks California 47th for business costs and 40th for regulatory environment. So clearly, even before the pandemic hit, there were barriers to entrepreneurship and barriers to business in California. But those were made much worse by the pandemic. Uh, San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland are all in the top 10 U.S. cities for small businesses that have closed permanently as a result of the pandemic and lockdowns and other associated public health measures that have been taking place, uh, you have three of the top 10 cities uh, for shutting down small business. And in fact, San Francisco is the number one city in, in the country for losing small business. Half of small businesses in, in San Francisco have closed permanently as a result of the pandemic. That's an enormous cost. And it's a cost being uh, felt by all Californians, of course, but in particularly low-income Californians, uh, typically dis, uh, underserved populations, minority populations and who businesses have always uh, struggled, they have been hit particularly hard. Uh, it's estimated that low-wage workers suffered job losses in the 24% range at the height of the pandemic, compared to just 5 or 6% uh, in the top-income in categories. Uh, and in terms of the recovery, we've talked repeatedly about a K-shaped recovery in which people who have white collar jobs and high incomes have found it rather easy to return uh, or to ride out the pandemic. I, for example, was able easily to work from home, uh, to simply move my business here. Uh, most Cato scholars have been able to do that. But if, of course, if you're a waiter or a waitress, it's a mu much harder to try to do something like that and simply pick up your boot uh, and start working from home during the pandemic. And very likely that you may not have a business to go back to. Uh, among households with incomes below $40,000 a year in California, 69% reported that someone in their household had lost a job, had reduced hours, or had lost wages as a result of the pandemic. Uh, that compares to only about 5% of people 
in the top uh, income categories who felt those same things. We're holding this conference because we, we want to take advantage of the opportunities in rebuilding California to ensure that we have an inclusive economy in California. That is one in which every Californian can participate and which opportunities are there for every Californian to start a business, to find a job, to basically to be able to support themselves and their families, to become masters of their own destiny, masters of their own fate. That is ultimately the whole underlying idea of the Cato Project on Poverty and Inequality in California. We want to be able to allow people to be in charge of their own lives. We believe that individuals can do more for themselves than government can do. But we want to certainly want to look at those barriers that government is certainly is erecting right now to people being able to do that. And so we've got a number of scholars today. We've got people representing academia. We've got people rep representing business. We've got activists. We've got people who are taking a wide variety of viewpoints on this. Ideologically, it's a cross section. We have the uh, liberals, conservatives, libertarians. Uh, I guarantee you will find somebody saying something you don't like, uh, which is just fine. Uh, I'm sure I don't like everything that everyone's going to say. And that's why we want you to get involved. Once again, you can submit your questions uh, and comments uh, through a variety of platforms. If you're on Twitter, you can use the hashtag Cato California. Otherwise, uh, you can use these. Uh, designated question uh, platforms that are with each with, with each of the ways you're watching this. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Our first speaker today is my colleague, Chris Edwards, uh, who is Director of Tax Policy Studies at Cato. He is also the, uh, the author of Downsizing Government and the uh, editor of downsizinggovernment.org. Uh, he has just released a new study uh, that's come out called Entrepreneurs and Regulation, Removing State and Local Barriers to Business. And he's going to tell us a little bit about how California is doing uh, compared to other states and some of the problems that he's found in California in terms of business growth and development. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Chris. It's all yours. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, as Mike touched on, this is a very important conference because California has a lot of recovery, recovery to do. California's unemployment rate at 8.3% is still uh, substantially above the national average of 6%. So California needs jobs and therefore it needs entrepreneurs to create jobs. Uh, startup businesses create most net new jobs in the economy. <laughs> so ensuring that California has a supportive environment for new businesses is crucial for a broad-based recovery. Uh, restaurants, uh, of course, were hammered during the pandemic uh, last year with thousands of them closing across California. So California will need thousands and thousands of restaurant startups uh, in coming months and coming years to make up uh, what was lost. So what can policymakers do to remove barriers uh, to new restaurants and other types of startups? Well, in a new Cato uh, study, uh, I argue that uh, unneeded regulations uh, there are unneeded regulations in every city and every state that they can and should be reduced to increase uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm going to run uh, through a few of those suggestions uh, today. Uh, some of these uh, you will certainly uh, will have heard of and uh, indeed will be discussed today. Uh, others may not be uh, so familiar uh, to you. So first, uh, excessive occupational licensing is a problem in every state. Uh, some occupations may not need to be licensed. Uh, a system of voluntary certification may be a much better way to open access to careers, especially for entry-level people. Uh, excessively high minimum wages can be a barrier to start up businesses, uh, especially businesses that hire a lot of entry-level workers, such as restaurants. Uh, we all want wage growth at the bottom end, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that small businesses tend to have much lower wage structures uh, than big businesses. And indeed, that's one of the ways that small businesses are able to compete against big businesses. Uh, about half of all minimum wage workers uh, are employed at businesses with less than 100 people. So the minimum wage uh, is really an important issue for small businesses. Now let me uh, move to uh, discuss a few regulatory barriers that you may be less uh, familiar with, or at least that get less attention uh, in the media. Uh, one of these is alcohol licensing for restaurants. 
uh, 18 states, including California, impose caps on the number of alcohol licenses uh, by county. California counties uh, have a set number of licenses. Uh, and so uh, if you want to open a restaurant, you have to buy one of these uh, often on the on the open market. And the costs in some cities of an alcohol license for a restaurant uh, can run up to three hundred thousand dollars, at least uh, in some cities, at least before the pandemic. This is a big issue for startup restaurants because, of course, restaurants earn much of their profits uh, from booze. Uh, these laws tend to be biased against lower income and independent entrepreneurs who can't afford the high license costs. Uh, alcohol license caps are an important barrier to economic development in lower income neighborhoods. Uh, let me quote uh, from a 2018 San Francisco news story uh, on this issue. Uh, quote, with the full cost of a liquor license uh, in San Francisco uh, now running as much as $300,000, restaurant and bar owners in the city's outlying lower income neighborhoods have all been but drained of the ability to serve liquor and cocktails at restaurants, unquote. When states impose alcohol license caps like California, it is the fancy restaurants in the wealthy parts of cities that get them, and it creates a barrier to economic development and entrepreneurs in lower income areas of cities. So this is an important issue I think that California reformers should look at. Uh, let me talk about marijuana laws. There is a similar problem with marijuana. Uh, pot legalization in California was a big step forward, and it opened many opportunities for entrepreneurs. Uh, but California, like a number of other states, have really botched the implementation of marijuana legalization with too many regulations. Only one-third of California cities and counties allow pot businesses, and nearly all of them put strict limits on the number of businesses. Uh, this works against independent and lower income entrepreneurs. Uh, news stories suggest that it is often the bigger businesses and the political insiders that get the licenses uh, in California. Uh, the Los Angeles Times reported in November uh, that, quote, since California voters legalized recreational cannabis four years ago, allegations of conflicts of interest, bribery and bias in the permitting process have plagued cities and counties, unquote. Uh, California cities, uh, quote, allow pot operations typically, that allow pot operations typically place strict limits on the number of licenses they issue as well as their locations. With permits limited, it is speculated that they could be worth millions of dollars and competition for them can be uh, fierce, unquote. There's been many stories in the California media, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar uh, with the unfairness uh, of the, of the uh, marijuana uh, licensing uh, procedures. Uh, the way the way forward, it seems to me, is to uh, liberalize these rules, to repeal these uh, arbitrary caps on the number of marijuana uh, businesses. Another issue I write about in my upcoming Cato study uh, is uh, the, the whole issue of home-based businesses. About half of America's 30 million businesses are home-based, uh, and most uh, new business startups uh, start in homes and garages, most famously Companies like Amazon, Apple, and Eula Packard uh, started in entrepreneur uh, garages. Uh, a huge variety of businesses, of course, is run out of homes, daycare providers, and music teachers, and small-scale food producers, yoga teachers, dog groomers, hairstylists, bloggers, high-tech startups, and many, many others. Of course, with the internet and new tools like Zoom, it's easier than ever and more efficient to run a small business out of your home. There's one big problem, however, and that is local government zoning rules that ban or restrict home-based businesses in residential neighborhoods. There are, of course, legitimate concerns about uh, externalities of running businesses out of, uh, out of homes in residential neighborhoods. But in my new study, I discuss that, in my view, many local, many local governments lean far too much in the direction of banning uh, or restricting home-based businesses uh, this is a really important issue because homes provide a low-cost incubator for small businesses uh, that may not otherwise not be viable if entrepreneurs had to rent space and they had to pay for childcare and they have to pay for our commuting costs. Home-based businesses create opportunities for people like single moms 
uh, who may be caring for children or maybe uh, caring for elderly adults. So I think this whole issue of home-based businesses, it's got some attention, but I think there should be a lot more focus on local governments on liberalizing these rules. Uh, a final issue I'll touch on this morning uh, is the whole issue of local uh, local building permitting for brick and mortar startups. Uh, building permitting continues to be a very lengthy and costly process in many cities. Of course, in California, the whole building uh, permitting uh, issue uh, has been in the spotlight because of the high cost of home building in California and the, and the resulting high prices for homes. But this is also very a very important issue for small businesses. Uh, businesses such as restaurants often wait many months, often a year longer, just to get the uh, permits and licenses they need uh, to open a business, uh, all the while paying monthly uh, rent for uh, a, a space that they, they can't uh, they can't utilize and, and, and earn revenue on. So these sorts of costly uh, delays uh, may not be so bad for uh, some big businesses. But again, for independent entrepreneurs, for people with less money, uh, I think this whole issue of uh, permitting reform and speeding uh, permitting and licensing at the city level is very important uh, to spur more startup businesses. So I'm gonna wrap up there. Uh, I think there's a lot of work to do by state and local governments, including in California, uh, to create a better environment for entrepreneurs, both home-based entrepreneurs and brick and mortar entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm going to pass it uh, back to Mike now, and I, I look forward to listening to uh, other comments today. Uh, again, this is uh, it's a really uh, it's a great topic for our conference. Uh, thanks a lot, Mike. Mike, you need to unmute. Knew that would happen eventually. Uh, Bill Gates talking to me through my through my COVID vaccine. It, it just you know it happens from time to time. I was thanking you for that and saying you gave us a lot to think about. And once again, it tends to think that we are on the uh, you know the people who are well connected and the people who know how to play the game, uh, the elites, so to speak seem to be able to do pretty well uh, under these type of conditions, but it's the marginalized communities, the people who haven't been part of the uh, the game for a long time, have been locked out, uh, they seem to do even worse uh, with all these regulations. So people talk a lot about good intentions in these uh, these regulations when they're put in, but they tend to hurt the very people that they, they want to help most. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Once again, I wanna tell people that they can ask their questions on Twitter using the hashtag Cato California, but they can also simply type them in on the event platform, uh, on Swapcard, on uh, YouTube, uh, or on Facebook Live. Uh, all, we'll take questions from all of those places and people can send them in. A uh, couple of questions, not surprisingly, immediately go to housing and land use because it's such a huge problem in California. Uh, the question was, what about zoning reform uh, to make projects, particularly infill projects, uh, easier to do and to basically lower costs. Uh, have you, you know, what did you encounter uh, in your studies uh, in, in that regard? So, I mean, there's there's two ways to think about this. One, you need legislative reforms uh, to uh, reform zoning to allow more, uh, as as that uh, questioner uh, talked about, uh, infill development and and more higher denser development. So, you need legislation for that. But a whole separate thing that cities can. Uh, can make reforms administratively is simply speeding the permitting process. I mean, I've read uh, about cities across the country that uh, have have substantially shortened the permitting, uh, the, the time it takes to run the permits through uh, the system. And these seem like common sense reforms that no one uh, should be against. It's just a matter of city bureaucracies uh, speeding up the processing. You know, I touched a little bit about uh, on corruption and marijuana. The marijuana and alcohol uh, related licensing corruption uh, comes because there are, are caps put on uh, the number of uh, these business licenses. But there's also mm -hmm. corruption in many cities across the country uh, in, in building permitting because the permitting is such a lengthy and cumbersome process. You will get businesses bribing and you will get insider deals to give the permits uh, quicker 
to the insiders, the people with the political connections who maybe are willing to pay bribes. Um, so, you know, per permitting reform to speed up the processes uh, is just, it's really important to uh, for, for independent entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and to reduce these governance problems. Uh, so all sticking with uh, questions of land use, but tying it into your primary specialty of taxation, uh, I've got a question uh, from uh, in, in t off of uh, you uh, Twitter that what about the land appreciation? Is land you know the sort of unearned income of land appreciation? Uh, is that a more acceptable tax? Milton Friedman, I believe, wrote about that a little bit. I know in California, of course, we have Proposition 13, which uh, limits taxes on uh, on residences and businesses in terms of property taxes. Often that gets gets passed on in terms of higher building fees uh, and impact fees for businesses. What what's your thoughts on uh, Prop 13 and on land taxes generally? So you know, in general, as as a lot of people know, Prop 13. You know, I'm in, I'm in favor of limiting government's taxing power. Prop 13 was, of course, a very complex way to do it, and has created a lot of inequities. I mean, one reform that that I'd like to see is I'd like to see uh, equal uh, taxation across the board, uh, residential, commercial, industrial. I mean, one of the problems now is that commercial properties. Uh, often pay higher tax rates. I'm not sure about California, but in many states and cities, commercial properties pay much higher tax rates uh, than than residential. Uh, I don't think that's good economics, and it also uh, is is a really anti investment um, uh, provision in a lot of tax codes. So I think uh, a lot of work needs to be done in evening out property tax rates. If we make the base broader, we can bring the the rate down and make it equal uh, across the board for everybody. Uh, Chris, you, you, one of your things in your study was you sort of looked at things across all 50 states. You made some comparisons, things like that. Are there states that are doing things right that, or that where California is getting things wrong? Are there states that California could learn from on anything in particular? Right. So some states, uh, so let's, you know, take, take, take these issues one by one and marijuana, um, Colorado has a much more liberal system. It's easier to get business licenses for marijuana. Uh, in Colorado, that has uh, in Colorado, it doesn't seem to have a, a corruption problem there. It's easier for entrepreneurs to break into the business. Uh, some things uh, California does well on. I noticed that on occupational licensing, uh, California is actually, uh, you know, it has it tends to uh, have uh, fewer occupations need licensing. So California does uh, well there. Uh, of course, on taxation, California is a high tax state, which is never good for uh, for business and entrepreneurs. Um, so the, my, the results of my study come out in a, in, in a couple week, uh, in a couple weeks. California does not do uh, well uh, overall, although, like I said, it does well on some things like occupational licensing. And, and, and I pointed out that, um, so with the restaurant alcohol licenses, uh, my research found that there's 18 states that put these uh, caps on uh, city uh, restaurant licenses, one of them being California, uh, you know, these should be completely repealed. The other 30 states uh, don't have such um, caps on, on restaurant alcohol licenses. Um, but there are states actually even worse than a uh, worse situation in California. New Jersey has this really draconian uh, restaurant uh, alcohol licensing regime where it can cost up to a million dollars uh, to get a, a restaurant uh, license uh, with a full alcohol license in, in New Jersey, which is one of the reasons... Uh, there's a lot of uh, top chefs. They they put their restaurants in, in New York City and Manhattan and not in New Jersey, even though there's a lot of high earners in New Jersey that would like to go to uh, top restaurants. They simply can't get the uh, the license they need to open the, re the restaurants in New Jersey. So, you know, it, it seems like an obscure issue, but that the whole issue of alcohol uh, licensing at restaurants, it's actually really important in a lot in these states, the 18 states with 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 caps on the number of licenses. Well, thanks. Um, <clears throat> Warren Matthews, who uh, actually on the event platform, writes to us from Houston where he's watching this, and he notes that Houston has no, no zoning. Uh, he also points out, uh, and I think he applies it to zoning, but I think it applies to the whole host of these regulations that you're talking about, is that 
politicians benefit from these regulations. And then this is a great way to rake in campaign contributions uh, is by promising various things in regards to regulation, keeping out uh, one group, uh, making erecting barriers to entry to protect incumbents, or promising that you'll cut through the red tape for some other incumbent or so on. Uh, how can you break the cycle, uh, if you will, where you know the, the people with the power to give money to the politicians who give more money, power to the people with money, and it just keeps circulating that way? Uh, you know, uh, all, all I can suggest is that it's up to California residents to sort of learn best practices for a lot of these industries uh, in, from other states. Uh, for, for entrepreneurs and businesses to point out that, you know, a lot of these, there's a lot less regulations in neighboring states and lower taxes than in California. Um, hopefully, you know, we, we see some, uh, a lot of discussion about businesses and entrepreneurs leaving California. You know, hopefully the California policymakers uh, wake up and realize that, you know, this could be a long-term drain on the, uh, on, on the state. So, uh, uh, that, 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 that commenter was absolutely right. I, I talked about uh, caps and the number of marijuana and uh, alcohol license uh, is in, in, in California and other states. You know, if you Google, there are so many stories about corruption related to these arbitrary caps that city governments uh, put on business licenses, and it makes no sense. Uh, you know, I, I am for, in favor of just, you know, uh, you know, with marijuana businesses, you know, certainly local zoning, uh, you know, regulations should apply to marijuana businesses, just like any other businesses. If you don't want, you know, marijuana businesses near schools and that sort of thing, that's great. That's fine. But it's these, these arbitrary caps where a city will say, you know, limit the number of marijuana businesses to say 10 or 15. It just creates this terrible dynamic. Uh, of 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 insiders trying to get the inside track in City Hall. Well, thank you, Chris. I think we're going to leave it there. Uh, I do want everyone to know that we're going to be moving after this directly into our next panel, uh, which is on economic growth and underserved populations. But I want to thank you, Chris, for being part of this. I hope people, as uh, so you said, it's a couple of weeks it'll be coming out. I hope people will look up online your new study on entrepreneurs and regulation removing state and local barriers to new business. Uh, I, I say I've read a draft of it and it's a particularly good study. Uh, once again, I wanna remind people that they can be part of this discussion, that they should uh, submit questions in the question box on their virtual event platforms on Facebook Live and on YouTube. Uh, also using Twitter, using the hashtag Cato California. And uh, we will move uh, in about a minute or so to our next, uh, Next speaker, a uh, series of speakers. We have a, you know, a business panel coming up talking about business in California. There's a, there's a surprise. We're actually going to, uh, to tap into the expertise of people who know something about creating some jobs and some businesses there. Welcome back, and we're ready to go into our next panel here, which is going to discuss uh, rebuilding California and underserved populations. Uh, it's a business panel. We have three folks who with us today who are uh, have have had some experience in creating jobs and starting up businesses, and we think that their perspective on this is very important. As I mentioned, we're going to need pro growth policies generally as California rebuilds in the wake of COVID. But we wanna be sure that minority and low income and underserved populations generally 
are able to be part of that growth. So we're looking forward to what they have today uh, to say today, both on economic growth generally and in how we can target those, ex, uh, those efforts to the people who need it most. Uh, we have with us today, Jay King, who is the president and CEO of, the, of California's Black Chamber of Commerce, the largest African-American nonprofit business organization in the state. It represents hundreds of uh, small business and medium-sized businesses uh, in California. And uh, we look forward to uh, his participation. Uh, we have Ulian Canete, who's president and CEO of the California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, uh, which develops uh, uh, helps development for Hispanic entrepreneurs and emerging Latino businesses. Uh, previously, he served as director of public policy and strategic partnerships for the California and Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce. So he's got sort of a wide uh, variety of uh, expertise there. And finally, uh, we have Rob Lapsley with the Business Roundtable, uh, which is one of the biggest uh, business organizations in California and represents all these folks plus. So we'll be looking forward to all of them to uh, speak up here and uh, hope you'll be part of this once again with your questions as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jay, uh, you're up first. Thank you so much um, for having me. Uh, thank you to everybody who's attending. Uh, we are in some interesting times, as you all know. COVID-19 hasn't just affected uh, the Black community, it's affected America at large. And um, as the president of the California Black Chamber, not 40% of African-American small businesses are going to be wiped out because of COVID-19. And 95% um, of our businesses are sole proprietors. Just want you to think about that for a minute. 95% of our businesses are sole proprietors, <coughs> meaning, meaning that they have no employees. The employee is the owner of the business. So the African-American small business community was already um, struggling. So COVID-19 didn't help. And to me, we could look at COVID-19, the pandemic, as a curse, or we can look at it as a restart, a reboot, if you will, a, re a redirecting of energy. And, um, and that's how I've chosen to look at it, and it's how I've taken it to my community, that um, we get a chance because the world gets to restart all over again. Every the COVID affected every community the same same way. We were already um, in, in in a bad shape as a business community, so we didn't have as far to fall as some of the other communities. But here, I sit on small business councils for DGS. Caltrans and high speed rail and Caltrans. I was on the phone yesterday with Tokes Amashaken, the director of Caltrans. And I am proposing that we create a coalition of all small businesses and the organizations that sit on the council that represent different fractions of small business, whether it's Asian, Hispanic, woman, uh, um, disabled vets, all the different disadvantaged groups that, uh, that are small businesses. And we coalition together to help them all so that we can avoid the Prop 209 discussion. If we're helping all small businesses, if we are putting micro businesses and small businesses in the same categories, not based on gender or race, but based on need. The ones that need the most that we put them in the category and we help them. The other ones that are maybe more functional and we help them in what their needs are. I think by doing this, instead of creating the divide that already exists in this country, that seems to be becoming more exacerbated by politics and by events that have taken place, what we start to do is build a cohesiveness, a togetherness. We change the culture of how we see each other because 
We're not picking one over the other. Now, and I can tell you historically what's happened in this country to African Americans, and it wouldn't be a beautiful picture that I'd be painting. What happened in this country, what the government allowed to happen in this country to African Americans is horrible. Whole communities wiped out. But having that conversation isn't going to help us. What's going to help us is the conversations we have about how we become Americans right now. How we start to make sure that our communities that are suffering the most, how do we bring them up? Businesses that are suffering the most, how do we plug into those businesses and bring them up? Because by bringing them up by bringing up those communities. What we do is we bring up California. We bring up California. We bring up the United States. We bring up the areas that are lagging, that are lacking. And in doing so, we make the country better. So I think we have to take politics out of our discussions. And we have to look at this situation from a bigger purview, not just from our little segment. So, of course, I help African-American small businesses, but I help any small business. I don't care what color you are. I care about your need. And I believe as leadership, we have to change the conversation. We have to change the culture. We have to change the direction of this country and of these issues by taking race out of them and inserting humanity. And I believe we have to become better human beings because today we have a tough time being human. And so I think I'm a little different than your regular chamber president, because it's not what I come from. I'm not versed in this part of the business. I'm versed in the mechanics of a businessman. I'm a business guy. I'm in the music business. That's how I started my career. I've had some great successes, won a couple of Grammys. Um, and music speaks to people in a way that, drops barriers and color lines and we have to make business like music. We have to make music business speak to people based on nothing except we want to see our country do and be better. We want to watch our businesses grow. We want to watch our economies grow. We want to watch our communities grow. We want, we want to build communities that can pour into our taxing system, our, our banking system, our business system. And the way we do that, in my opinion, is by inserting a lot of humanity and being human and look, looking beyond ourselves, looking beyond our own comfortable positions. Oftentimes we are comfortable around people we know, around people that agree with us, around people that look like us. I am, I strive to be uncomfortable because by being uncomfortable, I get better. By being uncomfortable, I, lo I learn more. By being uncomfortable, I push myself to a higher space. And um, I would ask each of you to take the time today to get eyeball to eyeball with yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, when was the last time you were uncomfortable to get better? And I believe that's what we have to do today. If we want to grow underserved communities, if we really want to help, then we have to get uncomfortable and we have to have uncomfortable conversations. Some of those conversations are about race. Some of them are about culture. In my opinion, 
the African American community has to become more financially literate. And when we become financially literate, we'll change a hundred years in 10. And just to give you a few stat, stats about us here in California, there are 2.3 million African Americans in the state of California. We make up 6.6% .6 of the population. We spend $96 billion a year in the state of California. We have 137,000 small businesses in the state of California. Only 5% of them have one employee or more. So we are a great consumer. But when it comes to investment and businesses where we lack, and this is where our leadership has to get better. This is where our leadership has to have a different type of conversation. And this is where we need help from other communities that are solid in other areas as it relates to business. And that's why a coalition, that's why we have to learn how to talk to each other. We have to learn how to understand each other and we have to learn how to help each other. So I thank you all for inviting me here and um, I look forward to any questions. Thank you very much. And uh, you certainly, I think are going to make people stop and think that that was really uh, in profound uh, sentiment there that you had there, very heartfelt. So I think people are gonna stop and think about it and I hope they are. Uh, next up is Julian and uh, we're gonna turn it over to you and let you, uh, it's a tough act to follow, but we'll let you, let you give it a shot. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. And um, it's, it's always a, a pleasure and honor to, to be on stage with, with Jay and, and Rob, um, you know, you know, Jay speaks from the heart and uh, it's it's always great to hear his views because he brings a different perspective because he comes from a different background than maybe someone like myself or, or Rob who have been in, you know, the chamber biz for, for years and years. So uh, Jay is always opening our eyes uh, to new ideas, new concepts. But, you know, to get started, you know, we talk about an inclusive economy and, you know, I have to give it to it and, and, I, and I'm gonna give kudos here uh, to people like Jay, uh, but especially Rob Lasby. Um, you, you know, he's been working with our organizations, I know the Black Chamber, on trying to create an inclusive economy for years uh, here in California. Um, but also, all three of our organizations have worked towards pro growth uh, policies uh, for years, even before COVID. Uh, it's just unfortunate that COVID has had. We've had to have COVID to bring it to light of of, of our policymakers, um, and and also the fact of of being very inclusive and 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 the barriers and and some of the roadblocks that our diverse communities, uh, people of color, um, and those businesses that are owned by people of color have faced over the years. I think we've recognized this for decades, right and and now it's come to the forefront because of this pandemic, unfortunately. Um, so I, I think, you know, as we move forward, what we have to see is that, you know, the our communities in California have been faced by different barriers in different communities. You know, in the, in the Hispanic community, Latino community, there's oftentimes with entrepreneurs been a, a language barrier. And you know, for us to have an inclusive economy, unfortunately, we, we, we have to be cognizant of those language barriers, those cultural differences that many of our individual uh, business owners and, and individuals in our communities face day in and day out. And that, that's really where uh, organizations like the Hispanic Chamber fit in, right? We, we had started just before COVID, a entrepreneur program. And and from that, they were developing clients to do business advising to, business consulting to. Um, I talked to my team a couple months after, and, and they were telling me that they had almost 300 clients. And I, I just kind of looked at them in, in amazement and said, 300 clients? I go, how the hell we get 300 clients? There are organizations who have been doing this for years that don't have 300 clients. 
And, you know, they told me it's, it was because we were inclusive. We were finally reaching out to the Spanish speaking community. Believe it or not, the Hispanic Chamber all these years had not had a very aggressive programming towards, you know, one of the biggest demographics, uh, the Spanish speaking. And, 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 and through that program, we, we saw the need of the importance of being inclusive. Um, and we've even done this on the LGBTQ side, right? Of, of, of also making sure that they're inclusive within our organizations throughout California. And this is all prior to COVID. Um, now with COVID in place, you know, we, we've seen what has come to light is how much our communities lacked, um, you know, diverse communities, people of color lacked in uh, what was knowledge uh, that they needed. You know, uh, we talk about the PPP loans, right? And why was there such a a, a discrepancy in, in, in how many businesses of color were getting loans versus, um, you know, mainstream businesses? And, you know, one of the things we found was businesses lacked a banker, you know? Those businesses that had a banker, um, they were into the mix real quick, right? They were getting the loans. They were getting the PP loans. But you you have to remember how our businesses think and culture, how they were developed. You know, many of them thought that their banker was the same, the, the, the young lady at the teller desk that they went to week in and week out to make their deposits or who they complained about a, a check that, you know, uh, that they didn't write, right? They didn't have a banker slash financial advisor. Um, so a, again, a lot of it went back to education and knowledge, I think, base. And, and that's an important thing as, as we're looking at developing an inclusive economy is we can't just be inclusive in them and saying, hey, we got to do business with them. We, 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 we have to also know part of that inclusivity includes education. Um, and 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 giving them the knowledge that they need to be successful in a growing economy. I think that you know many of our some of our policymakers sometimes have a good heart, and they wanted to you know they come up with a, a fantastic policy that on the face of it is great, but as we start peeling it back, so to speak, we find how it has unintended consequences for those same exact people they intended to help. Um, so again, um, those are things that as we're looking at, you know, pro-growth policies that we need to be cognizant of, you know, how, you know, if we're going to be inclusive of everybody, you've got to look at the policy from that perspective too, that what are the unintended consequences, especially for those that they intend to, 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 to assist here, right? And so again, you know, we worked hard to, to be able to, to peel back those policies and, and make sure that they they are con inclusive and even more so now uh, with COVID, you know, we, we saw how, how many resources were lacking uh, here. And, and I think in California, we're, we're in a unique situation, right? Um, and, and from the fact that, yeah, we're facing COVID-19, but last year we faced, faced many other disasters through fires, et cetera. Um, you know, we're, we're going to be facing a, a drought coming up. You know, how do we how do we manage that and get our businesses through that as well as we're pulling them out of the COVID um, crisis? And now we're facing a, a statewide drought as well, as well as we could be facing a disastrous uh, a wildfires as well going in. So, again, you know, we need to do everything we can. Number one, that policies promote the growth are not restrictive, um, but also are cognizant of the diversity of California as, as we move forward. Um, and I, I think that that will, you know, stimulate the growth and, and, and the continued growth of our economy, make it even stronger than it was. Um, but, you know, um, California is unlike any other state in the union, right? And, and when you talk diversity, um, diversity is more than just, you know, I, I'd say in some states, it's to them, it's just black and white. And um, I, I remember a um, an executive just telling me that one time. He, and he was from North Carolina. He goes, 
what we're used to is the black community, the white community. And he goes, we come out here to California and we got 24 different um, uh, communities that we need to, you know, collaborate with and coordinate with and, and talk to. And, and I think that's that's a lot of it um, that we need to do. And, and I think Jay kind of hit on it. You know, it's about humanity. It's, it's about a little bit more harmony in, in how we do it. Um, you know, um, this is, is, is about people at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, as we do in our office, if the cultural purpose is about, you know, those people and their businesses and, and creating stronger uh, businesses and, and making sure nobody's left behind is the most important part. And um, I think we can build a strong economy. But yes, it, it's it's imperative that we are cognizant of, 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 um, of making sure that our, our our policies, um, our pro growth, and that they're inclusive um, and um, understand the diversity of California. And, and I think that will help us build a very inclusive economy throughout the state and recover from this pandemic and also prepare us to uh, um, get through uh, future disasters. Well, thank you very much, Julian, and uh, I hope there's some politicians out there taking notes uh, as we go through this. Uh, I think they would benefit from, from some of this. Uh, Rob, I think you're going to bring up the rear here, so to speak, and uh, we'd love to hear about your thoughts on this. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Thank you for you know the Cato Institute for what you stand for, your value system, commitment to free enterprise, everything that helps business create the jobs that moves our society forward and really funds our services. Uh, you know, it's also a pleasure for me to be here with my colleagues, first and foremost. You know, I uh, the roundtable joined with both of them last fall to be able to defeat one of the largest uh, tax increases in California history. Uh, Prop 15 was on the ballot in a pandemic uh, that was going to raise $12 billion on commercial property in the state of California. Why that's important is because that's a tax on small business. My colleagues joined together and drove with their members a message that if we increase property taxes, it's not the property owners that pay more, it's small business that pays more. And if they pay more, your customers pay more or they go out of business. And it was their voices from this inclusive sectors that we have that were instrumental in defeating this property tax increase. And I wanna thank them uh, publicly for being such critical leaders in that effort. So, you know, now we look ahead in, in what's coming for California's economy. And I again, appreciate their remarks on this. And I think it's important to be able to look at kind of where California has been over actually the last 20 to 30 years. I mean, we've been through some interesting times from a downturn in the early 90s. We had the dot-com bust with our economy in the early 2000s. And then we had a massive, obviously, recession, a historical recession 10 years ago. And now we came out of that. And here, just over 10 years later, we're in a pandemic recession. So the question for the roundtable and what my members look at is, what are the lessons we're learning? How have things changed? And what do we need to do to continue to support the creation of small businesses, but also all jobs throughout the state? And you know, you're going to have a very interesting lunch speaker uh, today with uh, Professor Kotkin who has been looking at these issues for many years and has some very strong opinions. And I look forward to what he talks about today in regards to progressive policies and, and how that's impacting business. But for me today, I wanna to leave you with a couple thoughts. So one is, as we came out of the 2009 recession, California's economy had fundamentally changed because what we have now is we were growing high wage jobs and low wage jobs after that recession, especially in tourism and hospitality, but we were losing middle-class jobs. Our policies in California have continued to impact 
and decimate uh, manufacturing, for example. Housing in particular, we lost almost 70,000 jobs in construction, which we desperately need if we're gonna you know, be able to provide homes for particularly our communities of color in the future, because that's their only path to wealth creation. But these jobs, we haven't recovered these jobs. I was just in Henderson, Nevada a few weeks ago, one of the largest growth areas in the West for small and medium-sized manufacturers leaving California. Uh, the growth there was phenomenal. And the services that they're providing that you could see as you walk around Henderson, phenomenal. So California, as, as we move forward, you know, our policies uh, as we came out of the 2009 recession focused more on how we are transforming our economy for the future through energy policy, through particularly when we look at electric vehicles and, and other issues. It didn't reflect a commitment to what we truly need to try and move these communities of color and small businesses and their sectors forward in a way that would truly be beneficial to long-term growth. Case in point, uh, on this ballot, we just have the legislature passed a law that hurts and limits independent contractors in the state of California. How does that help our communities of color if they're small businesses, particularly, as Jay said, they're sole proprietorships, and yet we're limiting the opportunity for independent contractors. So those kinds of laws and the kinds of policies that California has moved forward in this progressive environment have essentially resulted in this. One, we have the highest gas taxes in the country. Two, we have the highest electricity prices in the country, both residential and most importantly, industrial, which again is especially at the heart of small manufacturing. We continue to have policies that raise the cost of living for business and for all Californians. And we're not passing policies that create balance to be able to move forward, uh, enhance job creation. So this is the challenge that we have with this legislature on just these separate areas without looking at our economy as a whole. So now we come to the pandemic. So what happened there? With the pandemic, our unemployment rate, particularly in the Latino communities, over 20% unemployment. Uh, for the black communities, over 20% unemployment. Now those numbers are coming back down, but this is particularly even higher when you look across our rural communities. So when you look at now what has happened since over the past year, you know, the governor had convened an economic recovery task force. We really didn't see much come out of that task force. And the business community has banded together to put together a recovery package over this past year that focused on what will help in this transformation in this pandemic, our economy to actually grow jobs. The key to that, telecommuting. So we put forward a policy to the governor and the legislature on how we can reshape our economy based on what's happening now with particularly tech, having the ability to telecommute, keep our jobs almost from anywhere, and be able to essentially keep our employment base and be able to grow for the future. We have not been able to get any traction on any kind of comprehensive telecommuting policy and, and modernizing our employment laws that will send a message to employers that California understands what they are facing in this pandemic, understands how things are changing rapidly in the workplace, but more importantly, wants them to stay here and is willing to adapt its policies to be able to hopefully grow here uh, as we come out of this pandemic. So we have a lot of work to do. And if we can together work on some of these policies, we not only will obviously continue to drive down our unemployment rate, but most importantly, we'll create in these key sectors, the opportunity 
to have a very rapid recovery. But one last point. So as we now come out of this pandemic, we still face huge challenges for our low wage job uh, employees. So particularly tourism has been decimated, as we know. Restaurants have been decimated. And so, yes, now to the governor's credit, he has passed a, 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 a recent package that will help provide some assistance and funding uh, for some of these individual businesses. Uh, and, you know, this is going to be for them a key lifeline for them to be able to get on their feet. The governor did a very good job in moving forward on that package. Now they're working on a bill to be able to conform our state tax laws to the federal laws in forgiving PPP loans. Again, a critical piece of what we need for recovery. And to the governor's credit, they are fast tracking that right now. And we expect that to get done. But while we do those pieces, we have to be able to, again, provide flexibility for employers, particularly smaller and medium-sized employers, to be able to adapt to these circumstances. We need, um, for example, help on um, liability relief so that as employers recover with their employees, their first and foremost focus is protecting their employees and their customers, but they have to know they get back on their feet. They're not going to get some crazy losses thrown down as well if something happens. We have key pieces that still need to get done that aren't being discussed. So we're all working together these kinds of pieces. We have to do that in order to be able to recover. We have to recover our tech sector, but we have to recover all of our sectors. And we want to be able to do that so that we don't put pressure on people like we've seen over the last year and a half. We've lost 600,000 Californians to other states to be able to have to move because the cost of living under these policies is too high. They don't they only see it getting higher and they have no flexibility or options unless they move to other states to be able to afford a home or be able to provide for their families over the long term, uh, particularly in communities of color. So with that, we look forward to the discussion. Thank you for the opportunity today. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Appreciate it. And uh, all the work you do that all of you do. Appreciate you being here today. I think we're getting a theme that's beginning to emerge here, and I'm sure we'll hear more of it. Uh, once again, we do want you all to be part of the conversation, and you can write in on your questions on your various event platforms, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or the Cato site or the Swap Cards uh, official site on this, or you can use the hashtag Cato California on Twitter. And we do have a number of questions that have come in already on this, so I'm going to start throwing them out uh, right away. One of these comes from our, our, our Adolfo Garcia, who's on the virtual event platform, and he notes that Long Beach rec recently imposed a $4 an hour increase in the minimum wage there, and one of the immediate results was that Kroger uh, is closing its gro four of its grocery store outfits uh, outlets there, particularly those in poor and underserved neighborhoods. Uh, he says, you know, what what can we do to uh, explain to politicians uh, about basic economics? So, so if anybody wants to take that, I'll, I'll be happy to go first. If that just very quickly, so. Uh, that is an issue. And it's also a great example of what's happening of what we're talking about in terms of some of the progressive policies that are being pushed that, you know, are thinking that they're for helping people when in the reality it hurts people because they don't understand the economics. So it's a great point. It's called heroes pay. So certain unions are taking advantage of the pandemic to be able to push for policies that they have wanted and haven't succeeded in for years and years. And so this is an example of one of those. You try and raise wages for grocery store workers without looking at obviously what's happening when you know stores are taking a hit uh, in this pandemic as well. Yes, they're making money, but what's their actual margin? So what happened with Kroger is they were crystal clear. The stores in that community have never performed in a way that truly is profitable. And so they were forced into making a tough decision. They can't afford increased wages. They said that. 
And instead, they had to make the decision to, unfortunately, and to their, you know, great sadness, they had to lay off their employees. Uh, this is the kind of thing that California can't afford in this kind of environment. We have to think bigger. We have to think in a much more strategic way. And when you get pieces like that, like the independent contractor law, those are the things that are going to set us back and hurt our recovery. Very much. Anybody else have anything they want to add to that? Or if not, I'll move on to the, to the guys. I've got a bunch of questions here. Yeah, yeah, Michael. So, so I think it goes back to what I said about unintended consequences, right, on a policy. And, and, and here you have, you know, a company that has maybe a store that is not hugely profitable, but, you know, enough that they can keep it open. And now this hero's pay kicks in and they realize we, we can't keep that store open anymore. And unfortunately, it impacted probably a diverse employment base of about 50 percent. Right. We're probably Latinos, uh, African-Americans, Asians, et cetera. Uh, and it was in a low income neighborhood. But if they kept it open, prices would have gone up and that would have impacted the consumer. So, again, you know, when they're not thinking out these concepts of of uh, or policies, um, you know, flushing them out fully of, of what the unintended consequences could uh, or may be, I think is, is again, one of the, one of the big issues uh, that we face. And, and this also impacts, you know, Rob was talking about, we, we weren't growing our middle class and all we do with some of these policies, such as this heroes pay is yeah. Okay. You, you pay them a dollar more and then you, you, you raise your cost, you know, substantially um, uh, as a consumer of what they have to buy and, you know, food, et cetera. So. You for a minute here uh, on this next question, because I'm going to combine uh, several questions that I've gotten that have to do with immigration. Uh, <clears throat> the need for immigration reform, the need for something to deal. Uh, you know, I was recently out when I could go to California before the pandemic shut down travel. Uh, I talked with a lot of folks, particularly down in the Central Valley, who said that Latinos were, uh, in many cases, afraid to go get business licenses, afraid to deal with government agencies that might uh, that might otherwise help them start their businesses, uh, even afraid to get banks uh, accounts set up uh, because of the crackdown on immigration. And we know uh, that uh, immigrants actually tend to create more businesses than native-born Americans. So is it, is it important that we have some sort of, that we deal with the immigration problem uh, in order to get California moving again? I guess I should take the first stab at this one. Um, <laughs> yes, I think we, we, we definitely need, you know, some type of comprehensive reform. The chamber has always supported um, that position. Um, you know, um, former President Bush had a great interview on, on the Today Show about immigration and then they swore in some, uh, uh, some new citizens uh, back in New York. Um, um, but, you know, he, he called the, he, he said, what did he say he wanted to call it? Not immigration, but uh, a border with compassion, right? He said um, that the border has to have compassion. We, we have to have a policy. I mean, we, we have to, you know, there are jobs here in, in this state that um, only immigrants will take and, and perform for us. So again, I, I think it's important that we, we, we have some type of comprehensive reform on immigration and, and system, you know, uh, pathway to citizenship uh, for individuals. Yeah, I don't think it's immigration that's the issue. I think it's illegal immigration. Right. Mm -hmm. And we um we have a help system here. Some people call it welfare. And uh, we pay into the help system. Some of us, uh, you know, with our taxes that we pay from our checks, we become unemployed and we have an unemployment system. And it's supposed to be here to help us. And so um, we have to figure out how honest we're going to be in having this conversation, right? Because when we talk about immigrants, we normally talk about brown and black people. But there are illegal immigrants that are white people, too, from Russia, from Australia, from the UK, um, from Canada, from other places, that we, um, we act as though that 
illegal immigrants are only black or brown people. Uh, we have an issue in this country with um, immigration, uh, illegal immigrants in particular, that we have to discuss and we have to be humane. And I believe um, of all the nations in the world, we open ourselves up to immigration, uh, more immigrants than any other country in the world. And at a certain point in time, we got to say, you know, we can only let so many people in until some people go out. It's like, you know, if, if you're if you're in a at an event, some people have to come in so other people can go out, but you can't once it gets overpacked. I think we're getting to the space to where we're we're mm-hmm. overpacking this country. And um and we can't make it about politics. And, you know, um and I don't I don't know who's at the border doing what. I just know that um humanity has to be at the forefront of what we do when we have young people, kids in particular who are without their parents. Um and we have them in cages and such, and that's a problem. Um, and, but I think it's, you know, we have to figure, we have to really have a, this is a tough, this is one of those uncomfortable conversations that we have to have, but because we're in such a space where political correctness is what we live for. Right. So we can't be honest. We can't really have a heart, heartfelt conversation about right or wrong here because we've been lying to each other for a long mm-hmm. time under the auspices of political correctness. Well, let me stay with you for a minute, Jay, for our next question. We have a question that came in from David uh, McAvoy on the virtual platform. Uh, the, the percentage of uh, closures for African-American small business, that's really an appalling number that you yeah. that you demonstrate. That's, that's really bad. Uh, do you have any information on how that compares to other other states and then I'll throw this in open to not just to you, but everyone else. How much of this is due to the pandemic itself, to people's behavior because of the pandemic, and how much of it can be traced to the various shutdowns and capacity restrictions and things of that nature? Okay, so first, um, that number is across the board. It's not just in the state of California, okay. that 40% number. It's probably higher in some other areas. So uh, it's a, across the board around 40% of African-American small businesses. And it's due to the fact that... Um, some of these businesses were already on shaky ground. So, you you know, um, when you look at banking and you don't have access, when small, most small businesses, African-American, um, they don't have access to loans and different resources that other business f- folk have. And um, systemically, this has happened in banking and, uh, when it comes to loans and such. So a lot of what starts their business is their own personal money. And so they're already at a deficit coming in and they're not investors. So I'm an investor. I invest in the stock market. I invest in cryptocurrency. I'm an options trader. You know, I I have royalties coming in from songs that I wrote. I'm not the average business guy. I'm not the average um, African-American out in the the space. So we have to um, really make sure that we become more cognizant when it comes to investing. I, I I think financial literacy should be the number one issue in the black community. That should be what our leadership should be speaking to us about. Financial literacy, becoming um, uh, investors in the market. We um, make up 13 and a half percent of the population in the United States. We make up less than 1% of inv- um, individual investors in the stock market. And those are the things I think that we have to change. Terrific. Uh, Rob, I'm going to go to you with this next question that came in. Um, we see uh, from Tracy Math, uh, Matthew on the virtual platform. Uh, she wants to know, they're t- working to try and increase employment through clean water projects. And of course, water is a huge problem in California uh, and has been for a long time. Uh, what do you see in terms of job creation and entrepreneurship opportunities uh, around water projects and, and the need for water reform in California? Okay, thank you. Uh, if I could just add something to Jay, financial literacy for all communities as well. He hit the nail right on head, and that, again, is a reflection of our education system. Uh, something hopefully I'll take a look at. So thank you for the question. Julian mentioned earlier, you know, we face these crises, these fire, but now drought. So drought's coming quickly to the forefront, third driest year on record this year. Uh, and we haven't even begun to touch what some of the challenges are going to be, not just for agriculture, but 
across the board for obviously all businesses and then what the costs of that are going to be as well. You know, we, we consider water to be, again, one of the innovation areas. That is part of California's uh, perception across the country. The perception is the reality. We are the innovation capital, both in terms of overall investment. And it's not just in tech. It's not just now in electric vehicles, but the innovation occurs in, in all of these areas. Water is one of them as well. We see growth in those kind of technologies. We you know, are obviously in a discussion right now in what's happening you know, around desalinization uh, and growing bigger projects to meet California's water needs, especially as we, if we experience more droughts and climate change. Uh, but the water treatment projects also part of that. Uh, we are going to expect to see a lot more money from the state to be able to address some of those projects, both clean water and um, <coughs> desalinization. So we think the future is one of growth throughout the state in California, and it needs to be, to be able to meet the demands if we're going to have these drier years. So we, that's what we anticipate coming. All right. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions that have come in on AB5. Uh, mm -hmm. And suggest that, you know, we know that a lot, there's been enough carve outs now that, uh, you know, it's sort of a rickety edifice that still remains on AB5 uh, as, as one group after another has managed to get an exemption, but it still sits out there. Uh, what do you see as the future of AB5 and what should be the future of uh, that sort of, of the gig economy in California? I personally think AB5 should go away. <laughs> now, it is difficult for someone to tell, even in, in the music business, if you're a if you're a group and you have musicians playing behind you and you're the front person of that group, you can't make more than two times what they make. So let's just say you have a uh, a group and then they have a band playing behind them. Those band members can't make can't make less than two times more than them. So now you're, you're regulating. Uh, I built this group. Uh, th this band is a hired band. You're regulating, you're telling me what my band members can, can make. Um, and that's not, that's not going to work in our business. Um, you have a lot of groups who have original members and then they have a backing band that, that didn't make the music with them. That wasn't part of the whole process. And um, just that alone is a problem. And then in, in, in our communities, in these gig economies, when you look at Lyft and, and, and ride share companies and these food delivery companies, some of these guys that are getting jobs in my community are guys who are just getting out of prison that can't just find work. This is the work that they can find. So if you make it that they have to be uh, employees uh, and they can't, and they can't be sole proprietors who work when they want to, because this is just might be one of two or three jobs that they do in order to make ends meet. I, th I just think that it, it hurts our community more than it helps. And I, I, I personally wish that it would just go away. And yeah. You know, eight, go on, Rob. Just go ahead. No, I said, you know, within our, within the Hispanic business community, AB5 just kind of rallied a lot, a lot of our business owners, right? Um, because they saw what it was going to do in the cost, you know, of doing business for them. But I think more importantly, one of the things they, they, they saw too, that, um, it would stifle innovation in California, right? right? right. We, rather than just saying, Hey, we got people that, that I just want to contract with to, to help me research this or, or figure out how do I, uh, you know, transfer technology over, et cetera. So I, I think that was the biggest thing. And I, I and I think, you know, when they had the proposition on the ballot, that was one thing Californians saw, right? That this was going to st stifle the gig economy, right. uh, but all economies across the board in California. But I think more importantly, also innovation, right? The, and, and the fear that I can't innovate because I can't afford it uh, right. b because of this regulation. Yeah. You know, Michael, if I can add in, so they said it perfectly, just, 
you know, this is a perfect example, again, of California's progressive policies. It should have never been signed. So the unions are trying to gain leverage over especially innovation companies to, for future, you know, labor union jobs. And what does it do? It sends a message across the country that California is essentially looking at innovation in a completely different way. It's only going to hurt our ability to re recruit and attract these kind of companies because they have to fall under a law that doesn't exist anywhere else. And our only regret on, or our biggest regret on this is Prop 22 when it passed last fall didn't include all companies. I mean, if you have to pass a law and then do all these carve outs, that tells you you got a big fat problem with the law in the first place and it shouldn't exist, number one. Number two, we wish the ride share companies would have broadened that initiative so it just wiped it off the books and not just exempted themselves from it as well. Right. But it's right. going to be an ongoing battle. Yeah, it was interesting, uh, of course, that, that uh, the sort of partial repeal passed by such a large margin uh, in California. So it, it shows people that get it. They yep. get it. You know, and again, especially with the sole proprietorships, to, to Jay's point earlier, why we would handcuff that is beyond belief. You, you know, Michael, um, you know, we, we, we had stories from people that this is how they got into business. Become right. an entrepreneur, right. uh, whether it's right share or being an independent contractor for, you know, someone like like one of us, right? And and it got him into creating a business. And so again, back to stifling the different economies here in California, it wasn't just about right share; it, it was about all economies and and all business sectors that it was going to also stifle the growth and the development of new business, new enterprises here in California. Well, ec economic reform is often tied to reform in other areas, certainly other areas that the Cato Project on Poverty and Inequality are looking at. One of them is, is education and uh, the, the need for education reform in the state. Uh, California is at the bottom in performance uh, in reading and math, uh, particularly bad uh, in uh, underserved communities. And we know COVID had a particular impact in communities of color uh, in terms of schools being shut, uh, lack of alternatives uh, for students there. Uh, are your organizations doing anything in terms of advocating for school reform? Uh, this is a, a question from uh, Carol Mathias uh, on the virtual platform. So let me just tell you, I work with Highlands Community Charter School. It's an adult charter school. If you're 22 years or older without a high school diploma, you can go to Highlands. Not only will they help you earn your high school diploma, <laughs> help you find a career pathway, and it doesn't cost you a dime. And right now I'm in a fight to make sure that that school isn't shut down because Kevin McCarty, um, one of our legislators here, is trying to make it that if you're over 24 years old, you can't go to that school, And which is crazy because the average African-American male that is going to Highlands is 32 years old. So 30% of African-Americans in the state of California are without a high school diploma. 30%, that's three in 10. And when we shut down these types of um, schools, when we, the adult education, giving people a second chance, it is, um, it is frightening. There needs to be reform, uh, reforming of our um, schooling system because it's not doing a job. When 30% of a certain segment of people are without high school diplomas, you have to Look at what our system looks like. And, um, you know, the, um, the teachers union is very powerful. And the state of, in the state of California, African-American males are five times more likely to be um, expelled from school from the same uh, behavior that their white counterparts have. In Sacramento, it's 11 times. So. There has to be a lot of reform. There has to be a lot. This is to me, this is a time for us to retool a lot of things. And um, I hope that um, we all really take the time. I um, mean, I, I can't say it enough to, to be human with each other, to make humanity our number one cause as a society so that we can um, be better. Anyone yes. else? Yes, uh, if I could add on to that, it's very well said. 
but you know, let's be clear, as we know, schools at the heart of our economic recovery, mm-hmm. period. So our heart breaks for the kids, particularly the inner city kids, you know, who have not been going to public school, who have not uh, wanted to go back in this pandemic while we watch private schools gear back up with proper mitigations and have been committed to getting their students back uh, under proper guidelines to be able to have some sort of in-person schooling. And public schools, you know, for the most part have not. And that is going to have a long-term impact on our economy, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, We don't even know what the long-term impact is going to be yet, but kids are now at minimum of a year behind. How they make that up, we don't know. Uh, There should be a convening of the top educators and business across the board to be able to try and figure out how we're gonna try and make that up. You know, the governor is working to get them back. He's providing more money but every time we seem to be able to have a discussion about that, they seem to you know, implement another roadblock. And if we don't get our kids back full time in the fall, everybody back you know, with mitigations for whatever the, you know, the pandemic numbers look like at that time, we may lose kids forever. I mean, high school particularly drop out, never come back. What does that mean for their future? And then what does that mean for our employment base? Uh, we already have you know, hundreds of thousands lost from our labor force mm-hmm. under the pandemic, uh, and we can't afford to lose any more. And education is the key to that. And they have to step up now and take a leadership role. And so we're going to be focused on that with the governor and what's coming ahead for the fall. Yeah, I think I think that, you know, the, the education is, is really, as, as both I think Jay and, and Rob have said, is, is really uh, the base for business, right? Yes. Where do we get our workforce, right? Um, out of our high schools many times, you know, and, and through the colleges, but they, they they continue on to college. But it, I think for business, it's important that we have a skilled, educated, you know, basically educated workforce yes. that can come out of these schools. And, you know, as, as Rob said, they're give, they're, there's more money and there was more money, but I think the concentration, uh, uh, Michael, to the to the topic here has to be inclusive Mm -hmm. and it has to concentrate on the students. They can't be spent on all these other things. It's got to be spent on the kids. And and, and we as businesses have a vested interest in them coming out of there, you know, with a basic education and basic skills. So and Michael, this is at the very heart of inclusion and equity. So we talk about those things. But this is where the rubber meets the road. Right. And now coming through with the pandemic, if they don't move forward and do what needs to get done, then that seriously questions, you know, what the commitment is to those principles moving forward. Mm -hmm. I we can't again, we can't afford to lose any more. And we have to have schools go back so our parents can get back to work. Right. Uh, That's what's hurting some of the recovery right now. They're they're still having to homeschool their kids. They got to be there for their kids. And that is something that if we don't have it by come August, the economic recovery is going to be dramatically impacted. And that is and that goes back to even when your parents, when you have an educated parent, the children are more likely to be educated. So we have to make sure that we our adult education system isn't lost in this whole deal that we don't. Because once we start throwing away parents, we start throwing away kids kids. And the next time I'll be talking to you, I'll be saying 50% of African-Americans uh, are without a high school diploma in the state of California because because we because we lose a whole next generation. generation. Well, thank you all very much. I really appreciate your uh, input on this. <clears throat> I think we set the sort of the broad agenda here that we really need to do something in terms of making it easier to start businesses and create jobs. And we need to get uh, the state of California out of the way as well as local governments and county governments, all all of which are a burden here. Uh, Our next uh, panel uh, is going to discuss that in more depth. It's going to be looking at uh, regulatory reform, the key to economic growth. Uh, Right now, we're going to take a 15-minute break. Uh, So we'll start up again at 1045. Uh, Those of you on the Swap Card platform, the official platform uh, for this event, 
Uh, you can go into a discussion room if you want and keep this discussion going. We hope you'll uh, take this opportunity to network and talk to folks uh, and continue to be part of this. Otherwise, we will see you all back here at, in 15 minutes. Thank you.
Child care in California is a growing problem for residents. Nearly 60% do not have adequate access, and those with access must pay a high price. Tuition at a child care center averages $17,000 a year per infant in the Golden State. That's about 25% of earnings in a $70,000 a year household. To make matters worse, the supply of providers is declining. Between 2014 and 2019, over 57,000 child care centers shut their doors in California. But there is a solution, and that is to deregulate child care. Excessive regulations increase overhead expenses for providers, making it harder to get off the ground and stay afloat. For example, child-to-staff ratios limit the number of clients a provider can take in, regardless of their capabilities. One study found that increasing the mandatory child-to-staff ratio by just one child could decrease costs by up to $2,000 a year per child without compromising quality. For the sake of families in the Golden State, California should deregulate child care services. Well, thank you all, and welcome back to this conference. Uh, for those of you who weren't around for the first part, I'm Michael Tanner, Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute and Director of Cato's Project on Poverty and Inequality in California. Uh, the first part of this uh, discussion today, we've sort of set broad parameters about the need to deregulate uh, areas of the California economy in order to enable low income and traditionally underserved populations to become more of a part of it as it comes back from COVID. COVID sort of serving as an opportunity now to make some reforms that are long overdue. Our next panel is going to dive a little bit deeper into some of the areas that really need uh, reform. Uh, we have uh, three experts in their field here. Uh, first up will be Congress uh, Council Member uh, Chris Kate from San Diego 6th District. Uh, the councilman is a graduate of University of San Diego. We'll, uh, we'll have a little bit of a University of San Diego theme uh, today, uh, I, I think. And uh, he's been known as an expert in areas of public safety, economic development, and the environment. Uh, we're thrilled to have him with us today. Understand he may have to run a little bit early today. If the council goes into session, uh, he'll, he'll be taking off. Uh, if not, he'll be with us until they do go into session. So, uh, so we're thrilled to have him with us. Uh, next up will be Anastasia Bowden, who is a bit of a Cato alumni. Uh, she used to work with our Center for Constitutional Studies. Uh, she also worked for the Washington Legal Foundation, but now she is with the, an attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation's Economic Liberty Project uh, and one of the nation's foremost experts on occupational licensing. We're thrilled to have her here. Uh, and then finally, we have Stephen Greenhut, who is the resident senior fellow and Western Regional Director of State Affairs for the R Street Project. And uh, he is a former columnist uh, with the San Diego Union uh, Tribune and uh, uh, written several books and uh, is an expert on California politics and regulation. So we're thrilled to have all three of them here with us today. I'm not going to waste any time because we're up against uh, the clock here. So we're going to go right into Councilman. Uh, you take it away. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak before all of you uh, at this forum and uh, provide some input on what's happening, at least here in San Diego. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Chris Kate, and I represent the 6th Council District in the city of San Diego. I have the great fortune of representing a council district where more than one third of our residents are of Asian American descent. Not only are the individuals within my district diverse, but so too are the businesses that call districts at home. <laughs> we have large employers such as Qualcomm, Sony, Google, Kyocera, Jack in a Box, and San Diego Gas and Electric. And we have small mom and pop businesses that are both family owned and minority owned businesses. In fact, I started a small business in this district when I was getting my degree from the University of San Diego. Like other cities across the country, San Diego residents and businesses were hit extremely hard by the pandemic. 
We saw many businesses close their doors, never to be opened again. And we try to take actions to allow them to keep their lights on and not shutter. Last year, our city council approved nearly $18 million for businesses as part of our small business relief program. We also work specifically with our ethnic chambers of commerce, the Asian Business Association, the Black Chamber of Commerce, the, and the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce to conduct specific outreach to these business owners to ensure that they were aware of the resources available to them. In the end, we were able to provide assistance to over 2,300 businesses that helped nearly 10,000 employees. And now we're in the process of determining whether we as a city want to continue this investment in this program. And if that is the ultimate decision by the mayor and the city council, I believe it's important we always look at ways to distribute small, distribute small business aid to minority-owned businesses more broadly. Some programs that provide small business loans and grants limit the eligibility to small businesses located in low and moderate income census tracts. However, many small and minority owned businesses exist outside of those census tracts and yet still face many similar economic and financial barriers to success. In addition to this economic aid, we also waived fees and burdensome permitting reviews for small businesses and restaurants build outdoor decks or set up tables on sidewalks or in parking lots to provide more space for outdoor dining. Obviously being in San Diego where it's sunny every single day, this could have been a no brainer from the beginning. Suffice it to say that this has been an immensely popular program. We've also experienced a devastating hit to our tourism economy. In San Diego, tourism employs 200,000 San Diegans in a variety of positions. Due to COVID, the travel, tourism, and hospitality industry lost over 55,000 jobs. One of our main economic drivers in San Diego is our convention center. Since the pandemic, we have lost hundreds of millions of dollars in economic activity because we have not been able to host many large conventions like Comic-Con. Until we begin hosting conventions again, we won't see the thousands of direct and indirect jobs return. But there is some good news. We're starting to see a rebound we're starting to see jobs come back. Just last week, we saw our region's jobless rate fall to 6.9%. But as we continue this comeback, we have to understand the barriers that will exist for many business owners and their employees. As a father with two young children and a third on the way, I understand the importance of having childcare that allows my wife and I to work. We are fortunate that our daycare provider has remained open for the duration of the pandemic. Others who have the ability to work from home have had to be creative and manage both their children and their jobs. But there are others who don't have the ability to work from home and have to make the difficult decision, both have to make the difficult decision of choosing between their job or their children. We know that without reliable, quality, and accessible childcare, parents cannot return to work, food and housing insecurity persist, child poverty is exasperated and the resulting family stress increases the incidence of child maltreatment, substance abuse, and family fracture. Recently, the San Diego YMCA conducted a survey of nearly 500 childcare providers in San Diego. In San Diego, at the height of the pandemic, we saw 54% of childcare centers and 13% of family childcare homes report being closed. As of today, 19% of childcare centers and 10% of family childcare homes are closed. Lastly, 40% of all childcare providers have reported that regulations regarding group size, group configuration, or enrollment as the top challenge in providing childcare during COVID-19. This statistic alone, combined with the fact that 61% of childcare centers and 40% of family childcare homes are not fully enrolled given current regulation guidelines shows that regulations alone can deter the ability of parents to be able to get back to work because they don't have access to adequate childcare. But this overregulation just doesn't apply to childcare. As I mentioned earlier, I believe the city did a great job of trying to break down previously existing barriers for small business owners. As we begin to recover, we will Will we, as a city, continue to maintain that same approach? One of the first things we have asked our new mayor to do is make the ability to conduct outdoor dining permanent. 
with the same speed of permit approvals as was done during the pandemic. My district includes a vibrant Asian cultural district with some very popular restaurants. They represent the epitome of family-owned businesses that are operating on shoestring margins. They have neither the time nor the financial capacity to deal with bureaucracy. And that includes any effort to increase taxes or fees. Like other jurisdictions, we are dealing with a budget deficit. Elected officials have made many promises regarding priorities and allocating taxpayer dollars for new programs and capital projects. Now it becomes very easy to turn to voters and ask them to tax themselves to pay for these items. Ballot measures asking to increase stormwater fees to pay for state mandates or ask voters to increase the sales tax to pay for general services becomes very enticing. But I've raised the point and will continue to say, how can we as policymakers in one breath claim we understand the plight of our hardworking residents have gone through and want to help them get their financial livelihoods back in order, and in the very next breath, ask them to increase their cost of living. I believe in, believe in order for cities to facilitate the rebuilding of an inclusive economy, we have to understand the barriers for allowing residents to get back to work, to get back to rebuilding their businesses, and allow them to prosper. Thank you very much. And we appreciate your work there, and it's great to get a perspective for someone on the ground who's actually uh, having to deal with these issues. <laughs> Next up, uh, Anastasia, it's going to go over to you, and I know you've got some things to say because we've talked many a time. So let's let's hear you from this. Well, hello, everyone, and thanks to Michael, and thanks to Cato for having me. Uh, let me start by saying I love California. I am California born and raised, apart from a short stint in D.C., but California is doing basically the opposite of what you'd want to do if you care about giving people economic opportunity, and that is regulating people out of work. So I'll focus on two examples of regulatory barriers to employment, the so-called regulatory thicket and occupational licensing. And at the outset, when I talk about an inclusive economy, I'm talking about an economy where everyone is free to reach their potential and where nobody's fate is determined by the circumstances of their birth. Basically, we're talking about mobility. What we don't want is a cycle of poverty that traps people. We want an economic an economic system that has the fewest barriers to people pursuing a livelihood and basically pursuing their conception of happiness. And yet California puts up barrier after barrier to entry. So the first policy I wanna talk about is not actually a single policy, but it's a phenomenon. And it's a phenomenon wherein there are several policies and each one of them might in and of itself appear justifiable, but together these policies create a regulatory thicket that makes it impossible to get a job. It should not surprise anyone here that a report by the Kauffman Foundation, which surveyed 8,000 small business owners nationwide, rated California a D in terms of overall business friendliness and an F for its tax code and regulatory hurdles. Now I've written on this phenomenon, and so just to give a few concrete examples, in writing our paper, we spoke to a farmer who complained about permits. Okay, you may say, you think about a permit, it may seem pretty normal or reasonable, what's the big deal? But all told, the small farmer told us that he needed 40 permits to run his farm. It's too much. Uh, or I spoke to a woman who wanted to build a bird sanctuary in my hometown of Palm Desert. But between the public art fee, because every new development has to pay a fee, which is a percentage of the project's, uh, uh, how much it's going to cost, and it goes towards public art. Between this public art fee, the fee which was imposed on all new developments to subsidize local daycares, there's an affordable housing fee, the application fee, et cetera. It was going to cost her $150,000 in fees alone to build the bird sanctuary. And as she put it, that's $150,000 that wouldn't even get her one pound of concrete or one count of, can of paint. It just wasn't feasible. Or to take an example from where I live in Sacramento, we spoke to a couple that had a dream of starting a West Coast microbrewery, but they were told that they would need to get special approval from the city's zoning committee, and the committee wouldn't even consider their plans until they either bought or leased the property and submitted architectural designs. And then they needed to pay a fee which was $15,000, and they decided to go to Florida instead. And the last example, because it involves a lawsuit I brought on behalf of a beloved Bay Area bookstore called Book Passage, 
Book Passage is a small bookstore. In addition to just selling books, it hosts author events, many author events a year where authors speak and they sign their books. And that's how this small bookstore competes with bigger bookstores. That's their competitive advantage. And as you can imagine, it's really important to the community because they represent viewpoints that are not always popular or promoted by the bigger stores or authors that aren't always promoted uh, by the popular, the bigger, more popular stores. Well, a couple of years ago, at the behest of Mark Hamill, AKA Luke Skywalker, California passed a law covering all autographs worth over $5. And under that law, sellers had to produce a certificate of authenticity and maintain detailed records for seven years. And failure to keep those records, even inadvertently, or to omit anything from the records, resulted in outrageous penalties, including not only damages, but a civil penalty of up to 10 times the damages, plus court costs, plus attorney's fees, plus expert witness fees, plus interest. And until we sued and the legislature modified that law, the owner of the bookstore had said it was going to put him out of business. How is anyone supposed to start a business in this environment, let alone people with fewer means? If we care about getting people back to work, if we care about people escaping poverty, we have to address this regulatory thicket, which sometimes can be a very hard thing to do because it involves little individual policies that don't seem that bad, but which add up. The second thing I want to address is occupational licensure, or what I think is better called occupational licensure lunacy. Now, there is a bipartisan consensus nowadays that occupational licensure has simply run amok. Nearly a third of Americans now need a license before going to work, but California actually leads the nation when it comes to lower income occupations. That is, it is uh, the first in the nation for the most broadly and honorously licensed states. And it's not just doctors or lawyers who need these licenses, it's low risk occupations and it's low income occupations that should theoretically require very little capital to enter and therefore would make a great starter occupation for someone who's just trying to enter the workforce. So yes, in California, it's not just doctors or lawyers, it's travel agents, high school coaches, court reporters, tree trimmers, locksmiths, animal trainers, makeup artists, hair shampooers, unarmed security guards, upholsters, taxidermists, door repairs, alarm installers, and more. They all need a license before going to work. And the burden of getting a license can be substantial. In California, you have to pay $400 to get a license to be a travel agent. You have to spend $500 and four years of experience to get a license to be a tree trimmer. It takes 350 days of training and passing two exams to get a license to shampoo hair. And has become you know, kind of banal or famous now in the industry to say, that's nearly 10 times the amount of training needed to be an EMT. Washing hair is something that most people do regularly without government permission, without causing a public health crisis. This is not just, nor is it fair. And even locksmiths in California are required to get an occupational license. And there's no training or anything like that. It's just a flat fee. Why this fee? You're just burdening people from entering the trade. And who's going to be hardest hit? People who have fewer means, people who can't afford the fee or who the, the fee hits harder. So we are trapping people in poverty with government imposed barriers to entry. And yet, despite all of these burdens, the studies bear out that licensure doesn't even improve quality. I mean, on their face, they're very often uh, there's a mismatch between the licensure requirements and the risk of the job. You get these really strange disparities, like I said, where it, it takes longer training to become a, a hair shampooer than an EMT. Or you get these disparities between states, between California and neighboring states, where California licenses a bunch of occupations that neighboring states do not, and vice versa, and yet there's no difference in outcome or in, in public safety. So it just doesn't make sense. And despite this very little effect on quality, there's very high costs to the economy. Occupational licensure costs an estimated 200,000 jobs in California per year. Now, uh, licensure also has a unique effect on people with criminal records. Of course, it's going to have a higher effect on this group of people who very often don't have resources to pay for the fees or to get the appropriate education and training. And even apart from that, people with criminal records are sometimes outright excluded by law from occupations, even when there's no relationship between the crime and the occupation sought. And even if there's decades between the crime and they're now wanting to reenter 
after society. This manifested itself in the famous example in California of firefighters. California, of course, has experienced terrible wildfires. And during a wildfire sort of crisis, it used prisoner firefighters to fight these fires. And many of these former offenders found out once they served their time and, and left prison that they were categorically excluded from, from becoming a firefighter based on their criminal record. This despite that the state had spent resources training them while they were in prison to become firefighters. Now, that particular example has been liberalized. There's been some reform on that front, but California still excludes many people with criminal records from becoming a firefighter, even though it uses them to fight fires in prison. Employment is closely tied to recidivism. That is the tendency of past offenders to reoffend. It should not surprise us then that with California having such high barriers to employment and with broad overcriminalization, that the recidivism rate in recent years is 18% higher than the national average. So we have higher crime because we are uh, licensing people out of re-entering society once they've paid their debts to society. So what's the cumulative effect of licensure? Fewer jobs. Uh, a study from Arizona State University found that there's lower entrepreneurship given uh, high barriers to entry. California has less startups per capita today than there were in 2000. Lower economic output, fewer innovations, and because of the effect on people with criminal records, we have higher crime. Now, there are ways to protect the public apart from full-blown licensure. We can require businesses to carry a bond, to register with the state, to get private certification, etc. There are several forms of regulation that fall short of licensure and would do just as good of a job of protecting the public. So what's the upshot of all of this? It's that if you care about human flourishing, if you care about ending cycles of poverty and people having more economic opportunity, there is actually a very common sense solution. And that's you have to start hacking away at red tape and making it easier to get a job. And I think that's certainly something that we would want to do is make it easier for people to get a job. Uh, but surprisingly, that's not always the priority in Sacramento and in city councils everywhere. Um, Going to have Steve Greenhood up next uh, with our street. Uh, before that, I just want to remind everyone that we'd like you to be part of this conversation as well. You can yeah, on your, all of your platforms, whether it's Facebook or uh, YouTube or the Cato site. Uh, there's a position for you on the swap card uh, site. You can use the provided uh, place to send in your questions there. And on Twitter, of course, use the hashtag Cato California. We look forward to you being part of this. And with that, I'm going to turn it over right now to Steve. Well, thanks for having me. Um, there's this weird sense, you know, among elected officials that everything is you know, really going OK in California, despite the shutdowns, right, that we had a 15 billion dollar uh, surplus uh, state leaders expected a $54 billion deficit. So, uh, you know, as AP reported, the re recession wasn't as deep as they had anticipated. And of course, it's uh, because of our um, steeply progressive income tax. Um, so, but I've seen it in the housing market, in the in the car market, uh, people, their, their prices are being bit, bid up. Uh, so there's this sense that, wow, people have a lot of money and things are going okay. But it's really just because of our, our, our progressive income tax. And I think what, what this does is it masks the dev devastation at lower income levels and among small business owners and small landlords. So there's very serious suffering going on. And, and yet I think some of this, this good economic news has, has masked that. So California lawmakers talk excessively about helping the poor, boosting transfer payments, which seems to be their, their main approach. But uh, let's look at what they've they've actually done, right? During the pandemic, the state government continued its policies that hit the poor where it matters most, and that's on the and and middle class people on their ability to earn a living. So first, they tried doubling down on Assembly Bill Five, and that was a response to the 2018 uh, state Supreme Court decision. Some people call it Dynamex, other people call it Dynamics. Uh, but that uh, the state Supreme Court imposed an ABC test. So basically, uh, companies can't use contractors except in some narrow cases. So the, the contractor must uh, 
have have you know have an LLC or shown that they're in, in business for themselves, be free from company direction, be outside of the scope of the company's main work, and that caused an enormous amount of problems uh, for average workers. Uh, so much so that the the legislature uh, received some uh, pushback that they hadn't really expected. Uh, now the legislature could have done any number of things. They could have created a new uh, employment category. Uh, they could have overturned the decision, but instead they they codified it but only after uh, politically influential industries were able to exempt themselves from the, its provisions. Uh, so, you know, the result was a nightmare. Uh, people were just lo losing losing their jobs. As a freelance writer, I, I experienced it myself. I, I work full time, but I also do freelance work. And all of a sudden, uh, people who already have jobs, losing losing side employment, people who, who do a lot of things, uh, we're losing job newspaper carriers, musicians, sign language interpreters, freelance writers, photographers. Uber and Lyft were the targets, but it, it impacted uh, every sort of, uh, of, of, of job category in California. So Lorena Gonzalez, the San Diego Democrat who had authored the bill, uh, she tweeted, not, they were not good jobs to begin with in response to uh, you know, some of the angry Twitter messages she was receiving from people who had actually had their livelihoods destroyed. So you'd think in the midst of a pandemic that at the very least, the state wouldn't be outlawing work, right? We're supposed to stay at home. So freelance work, people, people doing things from their own kitchen tables. Uh, where all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, being, being uh, their work was being shut down. Um, and the state attorney general, then Javier Becerra, was uh, filing suit against companies, forcing them to comply with AB5, even before it was fully litigated and before, um, you know, there was an initiative, uh, Prop 22, on the November ballot, which exempted Uber and Lyft and other ride-sharing drivers. And they were, they, so they were actively going after these companies that had provided, uh, they were providing important services for people staying at home, and they were also providing jobs at a time when people weren't having jobs. So ultimately, the legislature exempted 100 industries. That's a real mark of landmark legislation when you have to exempt everyone out of it. So what should the state do? Um, you know, first, how about doing no harm? Uh, stop doing the union's bidding, which is one of the main problems in, in the legislature, and understand that millions of Californians are dependent on contracting and other non-full-time opportunities. In cities like San Francisco, uh, they were capping commission fees on deliveries, which just made it food deliveries in the middle of the pandemic, which just made it harder uh, for uh, lower income people to, to, to get food deliveries because it, it, it disincentivized, uh, you know, the, the, these deliveries for lower cost options and it put, put poorer people out of work. You heard about the hero pay ordinances. Well, in Long Beach, it resulted in, uh, I think it was Kroger that shut down three different stores. So that doesn't help poor shoppers or, or workers. Uh, here's another thing. I mean, it's a little off uh, the regulatory thing, but how about running the basics of government properly? You might have seen the scandal at the Employment Development Department, as much as $31 billion in fraudulent or dubious claims, some filed by inmates and criminals. I mean, even in California, that's approaching real money. But the biggest EDD scandal is even as the agency was paying out absurd claims, it was not providing money to those who legitimately are entitled to it. Only 1% of calls from claimants were answered. So, uh, you know, it's not a surprise at a libertarian event, but, you know, government could start by trying to, uh, you know, fix its dysfunctional bureaucracies. So I wrote about that for my uh, Orange County Register column, and I, I got all sorts of sad stories from from people who, who weren't able to to get uh, money from claims that were were legitimate. Now, Anastasia did a great job on the occupational licensing. At our street, we ran a bill. She had mentioned the shampooing that would have allowed people to shampoo hair. And, you know, I'm 60 years old and managed to shampoo my hair without any ill effects. And yet uh, the, the uh, legislatures, uh, the legislators, um, they they wouldn't pass, but they wouldn't pass that. So if you have to get ten months of training and nineteen thousand dollars of tuition to to get a full cosmetology license, uh, that's not helping people. It's a good example of how hard it is for people to get their foot on the ladder. It got referred to the Sunset Review Committee, which uh, doesn't do much in the way of review and never sunsets anything. Um, so our, our state's regulatory heavy approach makes it tough to get jobs. Um, I hire a lot of handymen. And um, instead of helping them get licenses, the state announces new crackdowns and sting operations. 
Uh, there was one uh, press conference from the attorney general where they talked about economic crimes and stealing revenue from the state. That seems to epitomize the mentality. So there's not a broad understanding of what needs to be done uh, to help people get a foot on the ladder and not an understanding of how all these regulations, one after another, just makes it really difficult uh, to do anything. So I think part of the, the change needs to be um, uh, you know, attitudes at the top and an understanding of how this really affects real people. I mean, my daughter, uh, uh, she, she's uh, a Davis Aggie and she, uh, she raised goats at our, 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 uh, our property and she did that and helped put herself through, through college. And she tells the stories of, uh, you know, you can't, uh, you can't sell uh, goat milk and, uh, you know, there are new regulations on making it impossible for her to get antibiotics to treat her goats. And, and this affects people. I've covered as a, as a newspaper reporter, I've covered all the, the local uh, uh, rules, the conditional use permits that make it uh, very difficult for businesses to do everything. I, I own some properties and you have to get approval for everything, even paint colors, even when you're trying to do a historically appropriate remodel and then you have to submit your paint colors. It, it, it just gets out of hand and it's just the one after the other. Now, I, I know this is education's a little different, but uh, you know the unions have fought to keep the schools closed, and and that just shows uh, that just revised the need for loosening up the regulations on charter schools. And yet, uh, Governor Newsom's gone in the other direction. Jerry Brown was good on charter schools, and uh, you know, fifty five percent of public school kids are Latino, and ten percent are Asian, five percent are Black. I mean, if we want to help people get a get a leg up. Uh, in our state, we need to uh, expand educational opportunities. I know Cato did a, uh, a separate seminar on uh, on um, housing, but the housing regulations in the state have helped drive the prices up to more than $700,000 is the median price home throughout the state. And it's above a million dollars in the eight county Bay area. So um, people are struggling and, and they can't afford rents and there's just nothing available. And so state and regional, the, the state's imposing uh, some new rules, um, a housing plan demanding that localities approve a uh, higher number of, of, of housing units, which we need more housing units, but the state's approach to everything is command and control. And, um, and then uh, I, I wrote a recent book on water and our water regulations make it extremely difficult to provide abundant water resources and that's that's uh, harming the, the central valley it's harming our ag jobs uh it's harming businesses it's just another example of the way the state's regulations drive up the cost of energy which just makes it harder for people uh at the at the lower lower end of the economic uh, spectrum jerry brown signed a human right to water law but that doesn't provide water right there's still central valley towns in, uh, that, that don't have access to potable water. So we, we never seem to address these fundamental problems, you know, even as the state continues to expand the areas that it wants to get into, like uh, uh, single payer health care. So the good news is the state has temporarily lifted some of its regulations on restaurants, nursing ratios, alcohol delivery to deal with the pandemic, and the world didn't end. Um, some local zoning rules and parking rules have been lifted, and there's no reason uh, they should be reimposed. So um, uh, anyway, that, that, that's, that's the problem we're, we're facing here. And the state, it's mainly a, an attitude change. So the, the state needs to stop doing what it's doing now and embrace uh, more of a lower regulatory approach. And my fear is that because of the good news, the good uh, economic budget news, that California will continue to boast about being the world's fifth largest economy and forget that we're also the state uh, with the highest poverty rates. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, all of you have really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to have some questions now. I want to get all of you involved. And once again, you can go to your respective question areas on your site or on Twitter, use hashtag uh, Cato California. Uh, we'd love to hear more from you. And we have a question right off the bat from, uh, Greg Chambers, who worries that, you know, about the tax policy in California, which seems to be soak the rich, uh, what happens, you know, we're talking mostly about low income people here, but what happens if the rich uh, pick up and leave? Uh, what happens to low income people in that case? Anybody? 
well, they don't have jobs anymore, right? I mean, that's, that's, and there's the, you know, the seen and the unseen. We don't see all the jobs and all the opportunities that were never created uh, because it's, it's such a punitive tax environment here. And I, I, when I first came to California, I went to a, um, a press conference in Vernon. It was an industrial area outside of downtown LA. And there were all the businesses there announcing where they're moving to. And, and, and you know, a day doesn't go by that someone doesn't talk to me about uh, where they're moving. And that's so, so yes, uh, businesses are leaving, but also entrepreneurial people are leaving and they're not going to be creating the jobs, uh, you know, that, that are, um, uh, you know, that are needed to help the, to help the poor. So yeah, that's, that's what's happening. Uh, Anastasia, um, question for you. Uh, one of the things that the pandemic has done is open up more reciprocity in terms of medical, of life occupational licensing, particularly in the medical field, because, uh, basically you couldn't handle all the, uh, the, all the people with COVID and had to import nurses and physicians from other areas. Uh, and that, uh, the medical reciprocity became a, a thing. Uh, does that open up possibilities for reciprocity in other, other areas? Uh, yeah, I like to think so. It has been interesting with the pandemic that states have had to ease medical restrictions on medical entrepreneurship in order to solve the health crisis. So, you know, it became apparent very quickly that uh, nurses and other medical professionals could not travel to other states when there were hot spots. Mm flaring up or, um, you know, people couldn't change departments quickly. Uh, there are scope of practice rules where, you know, nurses and ERs that have to be under a certain um, doctor. And then if they wanted to move quickly to cardiology or what have you, if they wanted to move around, they couldn't. And so just to deal with the pandemic, we have seen some eases on um, medical entrepreneurship. Same goes with t uh, telehealth. Telehealth, it turns out, has been extremely neglected. And I think it's mostly been antiquated, although in recent years, there's also uh, been some um, anti-competitiveness and croniness going on where traditional practitioners didn't want to compete with people who were using technology to do telehealth. But as soon as the pandemic came and we you know, the government was telling us we all had to stay home. We need to stay home to contain the spread. Well, then telehealth became more important than ever. And so and so COVID has really forced us to deal with some of these restrictions in the medical field. And I think that's an opportunity to say, hey, there's nothing really different between the medical field and other forms of entrepreneurship. If anything, usually the medical field is considered, you know, the really dangerous place where re more regulation is needed than ever. And if we can use that as an example and say, look, opening this up to people licensed in other states did not create an influx of incompetent practice practitioners, other states are equally good at, at regulating their, their licensees, then, then that's a good thing. But I will add that, you know, we've seen a move to compacts and a move to recognition of licenses from other states, but that's not exactly a silver bullet approach. And I don't think it's a panacea because, um, you know, it's second order to just reducing occupational licensure in the first place. What we need is not to recognize license li recognize licenses from other places. What we need is to reduce those barriers. So it's certainly a step in the right direction, um, but there's more that can be done. Uh, one of the things people talk about a lot, we, as I think Steve mentioned, there's economic recovery, the economy starting to build back again. But increasingly, we keep hearing about it being a K-shaped recovery. That essentially, if you're a white collar worker, uh, if you're in the upper income spectrum, you, you, not only did you not, t you know, you're recovering now, but you didn't really take a hit in the first place. You picked up your computer, you went home. Uh, all the folks up there in Silicon Valley simply, you know, went back to their uh, their house and, and worked from there, and they're going to keep working from there. Uh, but if you worked uh, in a manual trade, if you were customer facing, if you were in the hospitality industry or something of that nature, you uh, you were out of luck. Uh, in particular, it seems some of these regulations in, in terms of occupational zoning laws and uh, things of that nature make it particularly difficult for people in those type of jobs uh, to to adjust. Um, what do you have to say about that, anybody? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think that's definitely true. And the other big part of it is, uh, you know, our, our state's uh, public employees are are. Uh, uh, you know, staying, they're still they're still getting paid. It's the the tech industry and kind of these upper middle jobs, and our public employees are paid uh, extremely well. But yeah, the, these you can't really start. Uh, Anastasia pointed to the the brewery, I believe, or, or um, uh, it's it's very difficult to start a business 
and uh, and that's what we need more of. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. It brings to mind for me how barriers to entry are inherently regressive. And that's because, you know, any making it more expensive and more difficult to enter a trade is going to be felt more keenly by people who have fewer resources to weather the storm or fewer resources to surmount that barrier. And the other way that regulation is inherently regressive <laughs> that the people who are gonna be harmed are those who are politically, uh, who lack political clout, political power, and therefore lack the resources to protect themselves through the political process. And that's why reform is so difficult, is that um, you know the, the groups that are being harmed don't have the political clout to, to get these laws pushed back. Instead, you get these very powerful interests who recognize the power of occupational licensing and other barriers to entry to shut out competition, and they don't want reform, and they push back against reform. And that's why I find, you know, that Steve and I both have horror stories of trying to to pass uh, reform bills through the legislature. Um, and, and, you know, my job is to go to the courts when the legislature fails us. And we find that it often does for these politically powerless groups and that courts are really our only recourse for change and the protection of individual liberty. Yeah, that sort of brings up my quite next question to both of you was right in there is how do we fix this? Because you do have this dichotomy of power. Basically, the people who are connected, the people who are in there now uh, do well. Uh, we're going to hear uh, our, our luncheon speaker, our keynote speaker, is going to talk about the neo new feudalism that's coming, where essentially the elites uh, uh, are in power and control things and everyone else sort of gets left behind. Uh, what, you know, what can these powerless groups, minority groups, uh, communities of color uh, do in, in terms of fighting the the, the the system. Wow, that's you know uh, it, that's really hard. I mean, if it's, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, well, I, I think the union. You know, I've written a lot about the union influence, right? And that they're just so it's such an immovable object in the in the state legislature. So even you know even like the the education example, uh, people from a broad political perspective have recognized uh, the impact impediment that the, the unions unions provide for education and, and police reform and all sorts of things. And yet it's very rare to see any any sort of change. And then at the local level, you know, local local governments are a big part of the problem, on, especially on these uh, land use issues. And it's not just a lot of folks who claim they believe in limited government. It doesn't seem to apply if it if it's means building something near their house. So um, and political organizing hasn't really uh, really done very much. Uh, but but my argument I, I guess has always been that we that you build you build the case and you you create the ideas and you get the ideas out there and sometimes something will happen and 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 surprisingly uh, like for instance the Cal California's redevelopment agencies I had been ranting about those uh, uh, for years. A lot of people had, uh, we, we had built a coalition uh, pointing to the way those those redevelopment agencies uh, abuse property rights, uh, abuse eminent domain, micromanage decisions at the local level. And it just seemed like impossible to get any kind of reform. And then the state had a budget crisis and Jerry Brown needed money because they essentially are state agencies. And he eliminated redevelopment agencies, and the ideas were out there. And some of, like uh, Assembly former Assemblyman Chris Norby, who was active in this, he had I, I could almost read in the governor's uh, um, legislative effort to remove it, uh, read the ideas uh, that that Chris and others had had uh, explained to him. So I guess we just keep pointing it out and 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 hope that at some point uh, some lawmaker will. Uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll join in. I mean, I saw uh, it was a fairly, a very liberal lawmaker just proposed a reform to Proposition 65 because of the impact. That's that's, you know, the warning labels that you see everywhere that no one has any idea what you're supposed to do about it. Uh, you go to Disneyland warning uh, chemicals known to cause cancer or whatever. And, and that's because of Prop 65. And yet, uh, 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 there, there's a proposal now that would at least require a, a, a larger, uh, a, a, at least require uh, uh, an opportunity for the business to fix whatever uh, might be wrong before um, getting sued. And that was because of the impact it's having on uh, um, on the Asian community. So, so we just keep the ideas out there and hope that uh, uh, people start listening. 
Yeah, Anastasia, I'm going to ask you for you get some optimistic uh, ideas on how to how to win these things. Especially, you look at the history of the of many of these laws, occupational licensing, occupational zoning. We're beginning, you know, finally to have a racial reckoning in this country and recognizing the long term impact of systemic racism in this country. These these are clear examples of that. Uh, some of the earliest uh, occupational restrictions were on Chinese laundries in the in the Fresno area. I believe was one of the first. Uh, the, the zoning ordinances, uh, both occupational and uh, and residential, were designed to keep the suburbs lily white, and we still see outcomes from them today. Is there a, a broader coalition that can be built out there that can take on some of these very entrenched special interests? Yeah, so um, I think there absolutely is. And part of it has just been a messaging problem. I think people who have been talking about these ideas for a long time have not been doing it in a way that appeals or makes us sound empathetic to the plight of people who need economic opportunity. Um, you know, I have a, a thing in front of me right here. It's a little RBG quote because Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been my, uh, you know, she's been my inspiration in one of the lawsuits that I'm I'm bringing against a California law, incidentally. And she says, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. We have won the debate in terms of economics. I mean, it's almost universally recognized that the free market, lower barriers to entry, provides better prosperity, you know, better paths to uh, uh, human flourishing, better innovation. We've won the economic debate. What we haven't won is the messaging debate. And I think we need to, to message in a way that's more appealing to people. Um, another, another cause for optimism is I think that the courts are starting to recognize the importance of economic liberty when the legislator uh, legislatures are failing us. Um, you know, we've, like I said, Steve and I have gone to the legislature. And if you try to, for example, deregulate hair shampooing, you get a coalition of licensed hair shampooers who show up and tell you that, you know, the, the heavens will fall if you deregulate. <laughs> Um, but then, you know, we we go to the courts and, and we put the, the government to the test and, and force them to prove that the laws are necessary. And, and we're seeing laws being struck down that way. So that's a cause for some optimism. And lastly, I think some a cause for optimism is that there has to be uh, a correction coming because for too long, as Steve said, we've had so much prosperity in this state. It's a it's a people have wanted to be here. It's the, you know, we have so much sunshine, it's beautiful and people will stay despite the bad regulatory environment. But recently it's gotten so bad that people are leaving. And I think businesses are starting, you know, Tesla, HP, Oracle, others are throwing up their hands and saying, this is too much. With AB5, we saw Uber and Lyft say, we're not going to operate in California if this stays on the books. We can't. You know, maybe in decades past, businesses have just sucked it up. And here we had a business actually threatening to leave. And I kind of felt like that's great. More power to you because, you know, consumers need to feel the effects of the bad regulation in order for there to be a correction. And so maybe as more businesses and residents, frankly, are fleeing, um, you know, we'll start to feel the consequences and maybe there will be a natural correction in favor of of the free market. Yeah, on on AB5, I mean, the, the legislature felt a lot of pressure and they, they did, uh, you know, they didn't go far enough. They didn't overturn the law, but they did exempt more than 100 companies. And then voters overwhelmingly favored Prop 22, which exempted the drivers. So I think if we look at the um, state initiative results, we'll find that uh, the voters can be a lot more uh, thoughtful and uh, supportive of these kind of reforms than, uh, than the, the lawmakers certainly are. And that's, that's an area of hope. I mean, I usually not the person to offer any optimism, but I, I'm a little bit optimistic. What would you look at for low hanging fruit then? What, what's uh, out there that you think you could, you know, moving forward, if we're going to do something in the next uh, legislative session or whatever, where would you uh, say it's low hanging fruit to deregulate something and, uh, create more jobs and entrepreneurship in California? Well, one thing I'll tell you that we tried that didn't work is, and I think Steve and I both did <laughs> independently, was to target some occupations where it just seemed obvious on its face that these laws were overly onerous. So, you know, Steve tried hair shampooing. You know, we picked out a couple in conjunction um, with a senator from down south that just seemed like everyone had to agree it was everyone had to agree it was ridiculous. But what happened, like I said, is that when you call somebody out, 
then you necessarily get participants from that industry to come out and defend the law. So we realize that is not a good tactic. I don't think low hanging fruit in that sense works. I think my, what might be better are some structural changes. Um, you know, I think, uh, uh, well, sunset laws, California already has sunset laws, and we find that that laws do not come down. Once they're on the books, it's very hard to get them repealed, even through the sunset process. But maybe creating barriers to laws getting on the books in the first place. So, you know, passing a law like they have in states like Arizona and other places that say that a law cannot come onto the books that barriers economic that sorry that burdens economic liberty unless there is a clear justification for it, and the government can prove at the outset that uh, that there are, the benefits are more than the burdens, and that there's a, a clear connection to public safety. So I think some structural changes that way um, are less offensive because they don't call any one person out. And I think I think medicine is also a good place to start because of COVID. I think telehealth things that uh, allow sort of innovation and technology to shine because people are recognizing the importance of staying home, of getting services from home, of utilizing technology. I think those are maybe some places to start for reform. Yeah. You know, I like some of the tele telehealth reforms, like in, in Arizona, Governor Ducey uh, signed into law something that allows Arizonans, they can consult with um, the, the best specialists anywhere, whether they're in Ohio or New York or, or Washington State. So I think that's that's kind of, that might be one that 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 might get some interest. Um, but Anastasia is right. I mean, the reason we picked the 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 shampooing one was we looked through uh, the the, the uh, occupational licensing rules and which one seemed the most ridiculous. And that one seemed pretty high on the ridiculous. Uh, the locksmithing was ridiculous, but it didn't really impose a lot of burdens other than a fee. So the shampooing was was ridiculous. And um, and, and then I remember the, the the state agency responsible for it. The, they had said, well, that's not really an issue. People don't want to just shampoo hair. And yet it was their eighth question on their frequently asked question is, can I just shampoo hair? So obviously it impacts uh, some people, and yet that that didn't go anywhere. And the, the main opposition was uh, was from the schools that provide the, uh, the 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 costly education. So so then on the other hand, uh, you know, Senator John Morlock, former Senator Morlock, had proposed a, a broader licensing bill that dealt with a whole lot of things. So instead of looking at the low hanging fruit, just picking out something like shampooing, he tried to do a more comprehensive reform, and then that was referred to like five thousand committees and was dead on arrival. So uh, neither, neither thing works. And then the Sunset Review Committee doesn't work. That's just an excuse that legislators can use uh, to say, oh, look, we're, we're seriously considering it, but they'd never sunset anything. Um, so, you know, I think we get back to the same old things like uh, political pressure. Um, and uh, and maybe in California, you know, the, in the initiative process, may maybe there's a place for some sort of uh, initiative reform. I mean, not, not reform of the initiative, uh, process, but some sort of reform that can be passed through the initiative process that has a lot of problems and it's costly. But I, I think the public would certainly uh, uh, certainly be uh, sympathetic to something packaged correctly and put on a statewide ballot. I, I want to go back to child care for a minute, a moment. Unfortunately, the councilman had to leave because he's been a leader on this. But it does strike me that the child care is a huge problem. Been on one for a long time in California. Uh, that a majority of Californians live in child care deserts where they don't have access to, to child care. It's only gotten worse during the, the pandemic. But even before the pandemic, uh, child care centers were closing on a regular basis and, and were being priced out $17,000 per child average cost of child care in the state. Uh, what would you recommend in terms of making changes there? You know, obviously, you have to balance safety and health issues, but you know some of the regulations and some of the uh, requirements that you have uh, so many education credits before you can be a child care worker and all that sort of thing seem designed to benefit big daycare and the big industrial concerns rather than sort of the mom and pop operations that people actually tend to prefer. 
Yeah, I think everyone, of course, worries about safety of children. It's one of those areas where where you get a lot of resistance to reform because, you know, it involves children. Um, but if you look to other states where there is less regulation, you don't find that there are poor outcomes. So it's helpful to do that. Um, I don't know if I could point to any one policy in California to change with regards to childcare, except for maybe, you know, there are very strict restrictions on the number of kids per person that you can have, you know, without any relationship to any mitigating factors or your level of qualification. And I think one size fit all policies like that tend to drive up costs and have an ill fit to protecting public safety. Um, and I, you know, I will point out that I think it was in DC a few years back, they, you know, uh, for the children, they passed a law that said that any daycare, daycare worker needed to have a college education, which immediately put, you know, thousands of daycare workers out of work and drove up the cost. So, I mean, I, I, those are two things that drive me personally crazy. Um, but generally, I think just taking a look and comparing to other states that have deregulated is really helpful to to calm people's fears when it comes to this and to combat that sort of near, knee jerk uh, reaction that regulation necessarily protects the public. Yeah, that D.C. regulation was interesting. I noticed that D.C. Uh, people could become parents without having a college education, uh, but somehow their their child care provider then had to have one. Uh, we also had a rule that they had to be bilingual. I think that was in Alexandria, Virginia. So uh, some things to look at there. Uh, we'll leave, we're going to be leaving you in just a moment, but I want to leave you just see if you had some comments on this. It's been kind of a back and forth on the, uh, what's driving housing costs in California back on the virtual platforms, people going back and forth on this, uh, between whether it's land costs or zoning or CEQA or all of these things combined, uh, where, where lies the, uh, the blame there? Yes, all of those. So, <laughs> so yeah, too bad the councilman's not here, but I, I remember when, when I was working for the Union Tribune, I had researched the, um, uh, in San Diego specifically, and, and the regulations add like 40% to the price of a new single family house. I mean, you know, con consider that amount of money. And of course, the land scarcity is a problem. It's not because land is actually scarce, but because land is undevelopable because of government regulations. And that's not included in the in the in the uh, regulatory costs, as I understand it, when when we do these formulas of how much regulations drive up the cost of uh, of um, housing. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's a it's a regulatory problem. And then, you know, a lot of conservatives have opposed, uh, you know, these efforts to uh, increase, uh, you know, get rid of single family only zoning or to to allow the, the construction of mid rise condos and apartments along old commercial strips. I'm all for that. The problem is the people promoting that are also against the development in uh, of suburban development. So they're not really for more housing necessarily, but for they're for more of the housing that they like. And that's where where we end up. So this local nimbyism and as someone who covered, you know, Orange County, um, and covered it at a local level on, on the editorial page, um, you know, you, you're going to, it doesn't matter how conservative the community is, uh, they're going to oppose efforts to increase density and build new housing. So it's it's a combination. And, uh, you know, of course, state policies. I remember when, when it was Attorney General Brown appointed to Marin County as the ideal for a global warming friendly development pattern, well, in Marin County, uh, it's, it's such, such low density uh, that the prices, uh, even back then, this was like 15 years ago, was was over a million dollars. So uh, that's not the approach. Limiting greenfield development and cramming everyone into into one footprint and slow growth policies are, 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 are what's uh, driving up the price of housing. Yeah, I, I only wanted to add something completely unrelated, which is I thought of low hanging fruit in California, and that is teledentistry. And that's because Draymond Green supports reform in teledentistry. And he is a celebrity. I mean, Golden State Warriors player Draymond Green, if he if he uh, is a proponent who could not be. And that's because the, the, the dental board here has been really trying to make teledentistry impractical. Um, it wants you to have to go get an x-ray prior to any teledentistry visit, regardless if the teledentist thinks it's necessary or not. 
not because x-rays are lucrative for traditional dentists. And Draymond Green has been very outspoken about this because he grew up with braces in a, in a under a single mother who worked very hard and he understands how hard it can be to pay for things like that. And so, uh, you know, if we have Dray Draymond Green on our side, I think that makes our, our fight a little bit easier in California for deregulation. Dental hygienists, for example, who cannot practice on their own but have to be overseen by a dentist if all they're doing is cleaning teeth. Uh, you know, again, that seems to be the type of entry level position that a lot of people could uh, could move into. All right, I, I do want to uh, say thank you to to you folks. Uh, really appreciate it uh, to the councilman. I wish he could have been long longer, but he had some great things to say, and you guys have been terrific in all this. So really appreciate that. Uh, we're going to take another 15-minute break here. Uh, coming up, we're going to have our keynote address by Joel Kotkin. That'll start at noon Pacific time. Uh, for those of you who are on the virtual event platform, we hope you'll continue the discussion and continue networking in our uh, and continue the discussion of regulatory reform in the breakout room that's provided for that. Other than that, I expect to see everyone back at noon, and we will have a couple more speakers today. Thank you.
And welcome back. Uh, as our day draws to a close, I want to thank all of you hardy folks who are sticking with us through lunch. Uh, guarantee that we'll make this worth your while for that. We really appreciate it. Uh, once again, I want you to know you can be part of this conversation that if you uh, type in a question on your various platforms, Facebook, YouTube, uh, the Cato site, or the uh, swap card, uh, we'll get those questions and we can ask them for you for our next speaker. In addition, of course, if you use the, you're on Twitter and you use the hashtag Cato California, we will get those questions as well. Uh, we certainly want you to have a chance to question our next speaker and to be part of this conversation. Because we really do have a terrific speaker uh, for lunch, uh, our keynote uh, address, as you will, in this conference. Uh, Joel Kotkin is the Roger Hobbs Distinguished Fellow in Urban Studies at Chapman University. Uh, he's also the Executive Director of the Houston-based Urban Reform Institute, a uh, work I've seen there as well. Uh, he is the Executive Editor of the widely read website, newgeography.com and writes uh, the new geographer column for Forbes. Uh, he has written a number of books, including The Next 100 Million, America in 2050, and The City, A Global History. But he has a new book coming out on the new feudalism, uh, which I think is very reflective of the theme of this conference, and we're anxious to hear much more about that. Uh, so, Joel, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you, uh, let you go with this. Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, the book's out. It's been out for a while, actually. It's uh, going into paperback relatively soon. But anyway, um, I'm happy to do this. I, I think that uh, I am sure that the issues that you're hearing are issues that, are, of course, appeal to people who are conservative. But I think they. I've been working very hard. I'm a. I'm not a conservative myself. Is on the issue of you know what is social justice. Um, and what we have in California is the best practitioners of social justice rhetoric and the worst practitioners of actually how it affects people in reality. So I want to get into that difference. And, and, you know, in many ways, progressivism as it is today, not in the Pat Brown sense, not in the Harry Truman sense, not even in the Bill Clinton sense, um, has become something that I think is really making uh, for a very hierarchical and unequal society. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Uh, okay. And uh, let's make sure you can see it. Uh, can you see it? No, not yet. Can you see it now? Still no. Okay. Let me, uh, okay, let's try it again. This is the problem with this technology. Okay, let me see. Okay, I'm gonna try it again. If not, I'll do it without it, but, um, I can see it now. Still nothing, Joel. Sorry about that. Um, do you guys have a? I sent you a copy. Can you put it up? There it is. Okay, you got it. Okay, great. All right, terrific. So, um, thank you very much. And should I just ask you when to move? Yeah, the just slide? tell them to just tell them to change the slide. Okay. All right. So basically. Um, a great phrase um, that a writer at Wired came up with, he called California feudalism with better marketing. I mean, in other words, people think of California as progressive and modern and the sort of state of the art, but in reality, um, it's uh, going in, in quite the wrong direction. A feudalism, as I described in the book, is about concentration of property in few hands, politics that uh, dominated by theology and, or ideology and California, it's a combination of um, anti-racism and, and climate fan fanaticism, which I think drives things. Um, lack of upward mobility. Um, when I moved to California in 1971, it was a place that people went. Um, very few people ever, um, ever left once they were here. Cost of entry for business or individuals was not particularly high. It was the epitome of the middle class, of what the middle class wanted. 
um, that has all changed. Um, so basically, if you look at neo-feudalism, I break it down the, into four classes. The new aristocracy, which are the tech oligarchs. Unf you know, in some ways, the tech oligarchs are both a blessing and a curse to California. They completely dominate the state's politics. Um, they are um, are able really to uh, uh, to create the impression, particularly when they do IPOs, that the state doesn't have to fix its grassroots economy because there's always going to be another you know um, IPO that will bring money into the state government, which it does, and some years and others not. Clarity, university, government, media elites. Um, uh, um, almost all with the same ideology point of view. Yeomanry, which is the middle class, which is declining, private sector middle class, and then the class that's growing most rapidly, which are serfs, in other words, people who will never own property um, and will be lifetime renters, and many cases won't have kids either. Um, the clerisy is the priesthood of power, as Daniel Bell talked about, people who want to order mass society. Um, this is a global trend. Uh, half the wealth in the world is controlled by 1% of the population. In 2017, the uh, UK House of Commons thinks it will be about two-thirds by 2030. So let's talk about California as we are an exemplar of the new feudalism. We're creating jobs, but, but um, not keeping pace. Incomes have become more unequal. Housing is incredibly unaffordable. Ownership is dropping. Poverty and overcrowding, which, by the way, overcrowding may be the single biggest problem um, in terms of uh, COVID um, infections and hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, migration, um, I just got some new numbers. We have been losing um, people in their 30s and 40s. Um, and the biggest increase of people leaving in the new numbers I just saw this morning uh, were people making about 100,000 a year. Um, Wealth has become more concentrated. Um, COVID's made it worse. And of course, our education system um, is not allowing for the upward mobility that earlier generations were able to get from a, a good education system. So again, this is Antonio Garcia Martinez's comment, feudalism with better marketing. If you look at an inequality, now it's amazing how this doesn't get reported. Is Aren't you shocked? Um, California has is one of the most unequal states. It has four of the poorest low-income MSAs in the United States, uh, Central Valley, which um, as the Bay Area and to some extent parts of coastal Southern California control the government, the interior areas have been very hard hit. 86% um, of the jobs that we added in the last decade paid under the median income and 48% paid under 40,000. And as you can see, we've created some good jobs. We've actually had a reduction in the number of jobs um, that we had uh, in um, the middle area. Um, and we've really been adding low income jobs. So you combine low incomes and high costs, it's not so good. Um, and other states are doing much better and, 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 get, and other regions are doing much better than ours. Uh, our, even Orange County and Silicon Valley and even worse, L.A., uh, are below the national average in terms of how many $100,000 plus jobs are created for every 40,000 job. No, big surprise here, California, the highest poverty rate in the country if you adjust for costs. Um, and of course, this is um, very different than what it used to be. Um, it's also one of those statistics that uh, the media doesn't seem to like very much. Um, and of course, we have homeless. Uh, we're, we're very good at producing homeless people. But I want to add, for every homeless person, there are numerous people staying at hotels, sleeping on people's couches, sleeping in their cars. So the homeless are really just the, the tip of the iceberg. And the big problem we have is there's no way of moving up. You don't have middle class jobs. You don't have upwardly mobile jobs. Yes, if I've got a PhD from Caltech, I'm in good shape. Um, for most people, not so great. And we do absolutely the worst outside. Only um, Alaska uh, does worse uh, in terms of um, how our students do um, on math testing, for instance, in low income. Some of the worst schools for low income people in the United States and, and are in California. And actually, 
the worst one by one study is San Francisco, where I'm sure they're taught all the essentials of clinical, you know, critical race theory and uh, not too much about that two and two actually does equal four. Home ownership has been lagging. This is another where, place where the middle class is in trouble. You can see that, let's say, Latinos in um, uh, in the Texas big metros, about 50% own their own home. It's about 35% in L.A. And when we start drilling down, what we're finding is the Latino and African-American homeowners tend to be much older because they bought when you could afford to buy. Uh, so what's happening demographically? Um California, um, which has historically grown faster than the national average, uh, sort of about 2015, they, the lines crossed. Um, today, California is actually um, has actually now has negative. Um, it's, it's gone negative, and amazingly, something I never thought I would see, uh, we're going to lose one and maybe two congressional seats. Um, and if you want to drill down a little bit more, what you can see is that in places like Los Angeles, the population of LA has been declining for years now. Um, and the only places that are growing at all are in the suburbs, particularly Riverside. And of course, um, these are very areas that the state doesn't want to see grow. They want everybody to live in a studio apartment in, in, uh, in the heart of a big city, which um, obviously, A, they don't want to, B, it's very expensive. This, I think, is one of the most revealing statistics I wanted to share with you. Um, we've been ch chasing um, the numbers on foreign-born, because I always consider them kind of canaries in the coal mine. They're going to go where there's opportunity. And in the 80s, they came to L.A. in enormous numbers. In the last 10 years, um, the foreign-born population has declined. Um and uh, in New York, it's stagnated. Chicago, by the way, is also negative. Um, and the big growth is really Nashville, Charlotte, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston. Uh, Houston, by the way, is now the most diverse city in the country. So what's happening is the foreign born who were driving uh, California's growth in many areas uh, and certainly were very important entrepreneurially um, are now going elsewhere. Same uh, pattern in the 25 to 34 uh, pattern. Um, and this is all pre-COVID. So you've got to imagine it's probably worse now. So just to sum up and then I'd be happy to take questions. Um, the uh, um, But the reform regulatory rules, I think this is something that people talk about and I think is quite relevant. Um, where I see a problem where I have a little disagreement with, I'm sure, some of the people at this event who say, let's get rid of all zoning and, you know, what, let's wipe out the last single family neighborhoods in California. I, I think that's what people want. They want single family homes, townhomes. They're certainly, if they want to have children, that's where they're going to go. I think where, where there is great opportunity um, is in the suburbs and exurbs. Um, very difficult to build anything here. Many developers who are based in California are now, um, uh, if, even if they keep their offices here, doing all their development elsewhere. Um, I think creating a lot of expensive small apartments, which is all you can do economically in the core cities, um, doesn't solve any of the real problems. The real problems we have in California are housing for middle-class families, and that doesn't address the issue. Um, the, the key thing that we need to do is to allow development on the periphery and to take advantage of an enormous, enormous opportunity that we have in, um, in redundant retail and re redundant office space. Um, and there's, it's going to be ever more redundant the way things are going. Um, and this is also a regulatory issue because the regulations – um, are in part, A, make it very hard to make these conversions, but also the tax structure. Local areas have no incentive to build housing because they, they depend on retail sales. Um, and if retail sales are, are uh, taken away, they have no way to pay for what they need for the new residents. I think we need to, to give more incentives to communities of all kinds um, that if they want to build uh, more 
um, they, they, they are, there's a tax benefit to that. Right now, the system discourages cities from, from having um, uh, new, uh, new housing. Um, I think in terms of, uh, of, of employment, one of the terrible things about the climate change policies in California is we make it very hard to grow jobs in anything that relies on electricity um, or on, on, on any kind of fossil fuel um, because of the extremely high prices. So if you talk to the last steel makers in California who provide good upper middle class jobs and, and, and also a lot of good blue collar jobs, uh, they can't expand. Um, if you take a look at what's happening uh, on the in the port, I think long term, the early electric mandates um, are already been looked into it. Uh, uh, people are thinking about going elsewhere. That's another big area of good blue collar jobs. Um, and of course, from a climate point of view, it's kind of absurd because if you take a factory and you and that factory moves to Texas or Arizona, their carbon footprint goes up just because of the weather. Um, and if it goes to China, it's likely to be powered by coal. So, you know, in a way, what this has all become is virtue signaling. We're going to show how low our emissions is. And of course, a great irony is California hasn't been particularly good at reducing emissions. And due to the fires, actually, we've done worse. So, you know, it, it's all about, you know, with the whole question of, can I look at myself in the mirror? As opposed to actually accomplishing anything, and by the way, you can you can talk about that with education. You can talk about that with almost any um, field. That California politicians are wonderful at making heartfelt egalitarian statements, and and particularly skilled in creating policies that make things more unequal and taking away more opportunity for middle and working class people. Transportation. Um, in Los Angeles, we spent $20 billion on a rail system that um, has resulted in a decline in the share of people taking transit compared to 1990. Um, you know, we're going to end up with more and more, uh, you know, with the new stimulus bills and infrastructure bills, empty buses. I mean, I, I, the, I see the Orange County buses, they're empty. They were empty before COVID, and of course, they're completely empty now. So I think we have to say, how do we go and have new kind of transportation policies? One would be obviously encouraging the development of, um, uh, of uh, online um, activities, which a lot of other states have been emphasizing. That's one way to reduce it. Um, and it also uh, reduce uh, the greenhouse gases. And it's it's a way to reduce traffic. Um, there are things we could do with eventually with autonomous vehicles. Um, uh, to some extent, what's happened with Uber and Lyft um, in some communities, um, actually they've gotten rid of their buses and they give vouchers for people to do Uber and Lyft to get to get to work. Um, I think there are many innovative solutions that we need that are 21st century oriented. And finally, overall, we have to stop giving this idea that if California will show the way through greenhouse gas reductions, we are insignificant. California could fall in the ocean tomorrow and it would make no demonstrable in, uh, uh, impact on climate. Um, the reality is in a month, China could wipe out everything we do in a year, in, just in the state of California. And yet our policymakers don't even want to consider what the impact is on families and communities and workers um, by their policies. So anyway, uh, hopefully that gave you uh, some idea of where I'm coming from. And I'd be very uh, interested in uh, uh, answering any questions if you have any. I can't hear you. Once again, I'm on mute, uh, which a lot of people would prefer, but uh, once again, uh, we've got a very provocative thesis here. Uh, I think it's something that uh, people will think about a lot. Uh, I think you come at this from a very interesting perspective that uh, kind of defies the usual left-right uh, space. Um, do we do want to get you involved in this? So please, uh, if you have any questions for Joel, 
You can send them via the, your platforms or on Twitter at uh, hashtag Cato California. And I've got a couple I want to start off with here. You mentioned the, the need to prioritize in the creation of good paying jobs. Uh, right. Which you know sounds a bit like a stereotype. Every, every politician has ever run for office says he's for good jobs and good wages or something of that nature. How would you go about that? We've we've already seen we've had some discussion today that the idea of just simply mandating it seems counterproductive. I mean, it, you get Kroger closing their stores when you right. demand that they pay more and stuff like that, and that just hurts low income neighborhoods. How how would you go about uh, incentivizing the creation of good paying jobs? Well, I think what you do is that most of it is, first of all, they got to improve the regulatory environment. Um, you're not going to create jobs that, that employ, you know, a middle and working class people if they can't afford to live nearby uh, or, or even live not so nearby. Um, so obviously the regulatory side, you know, you just have to, um, you know, you have to not impose incredible conditions vis-a-vis -vis climate, make it very hard for those jobs. There are positive things that we could do in California. I mean, we have industries, for instance, like space, where I think we have some great advantages that we can build on. And there, there may be some sort of government in, uh, encouraged uh, cooperation between various companies. I think that might work particularly in the local level. Uh, the city of Long Beach, is, uh, to me, is the great model of how you can do it. Um, They've also developed in their education system, both K through 12 and, and the community colleges, and most particularly um, the uh, Cal State, to line up with the manufacturing, trade, and, um, and space industries that flourish there. Um, so, but we have to be able to say, look, um, you have to have a, an environment. You know, when people want to build something, and let's say at, like Tahone Ranch, and they spend 20, 30 years trying to get it approved, you know, you don't think these developers and these companies talk to each other and they'll say, you know, um, they'll, I'll never do that again. I'll never go to a place where for six months I'm sitting around, you know, or, uh, to get the minor approvals and I could be 10, 20 years. That's why people move to Texas. That's why they move to Tennessee. That's why they moved to Arizona. Believe me, none of those places are nicer than California. Uh, and I would argue particularly Southern California, but California in general is a great place. But if you make it impossible for anything but the most elite jobs and the low-end service jobs, you're going to have a profoundly un, uh, unequal society. Yeah, definitely. And one of the areas where, the, you know, you talk about people talk a progressive game and then don't uh, follow through is on education. And oh, this is an area... Uh, you know, you know, in San Francisco, where the schools are closed, leaving uh, poor and uh, underserved children uh, unable to get the education they need. But the school the district is spending a great deal of time trying to figure out how to rename the schools mm -hmm. uh, and stuff of that nature. Uh, it, this seems emblematic of, of kind of an ongoing situation. You talk about it as feudalism. There's certainly a power differential in here where you, the elites have a, one set of concerns and uh, the people affected by them seem to have a very different set of concerns. How can that, how can that power differential be overcome? That's a great question. I mean, I think it's going to be a very difficult, a, the media with very few exceptions in California is essentially a one party media. I mean, it's, you know, um, I mean, I remember working on some pieces um, for an editor of a major newspaper here uh, which showed, you know, some of the numbers of where California was relative to the rest of the country. And my editor said to me, I never heard this. This is never in a paper. So I had to show her the BLS or census <laughs> numbers to show her that, that I wasn't making this up. Um, so first of all, you have to figure out some way to uh, get people to know what's going on. Now, the good thing is the polling is showing that people are beginning to become uh, aware of what the regulatory environment is doing in California. So there is some hope there. Um, I think you really have to come up with a very practical program. I mean, when I look at education um, in particular, um, you know, I don't think a lot of parents really want their kids to be, you know, uh, giving a, 
you know, Aztec uh, war cries or, you know, or that they want their kids to not have to do well in math because math is racist or something like that. The problem we have, and it's not just in California, but it's intense in California, and is that our teachers are, and our teachers' unions have become essentially the, 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 you know, the new Red Guards. I mean, they're, they, they adopt incredible, um, incredibly, in quote, progressive or far left ideologies. Um, they are, uh, they are not, they are, they are not anxious in many cases to open the schools. Um, and they, they know that they, they have the politicians. I had a friend, a Democrat who was a state Senator. And she told me that it went on bills on education the way that members of the Democratic caucus voted was they looked at their phones and, and were told what to do by the lobbyists of the teachers' unions. That's probably not the best way to make education policy. Um, and I think also that I think there's a desire to get a, have a skill, learn something that can actually get you somewhere. And we've been moving in the exact opposite direction. Many states, by the way, uh, I know Tennessee in particular, but there are other states, Ohio, that have really uh, emphasized skills training. So like one program I know, they take young kids in places like Cleveland and they train them how to be welders and they get good jobs in, 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 uh, in Ohio. We don't seem to be interested in doing that at all, at all. And of course, there's not a lot of motivation if manufacturing and other blue collar jobs are disappearing, then what's the motivation of learning those skills? question at the end uh, on kind of how to do this uh where should uh, people focus their attention is this, is this a state level local level counties where's where's the uh weak point in terms of changing things well i mean the state is of course the big enchilada and the what's going you know what the that's who sets policy so that has to be it but it has to be at the local level the city level the county level um I mean, one of the things I've noticed, um, having moved from Los Angeles to Orange County, the fact that there's a two-party system in Orange County means that Democrats have to be more reasonable. Uh, Republicans have to compete for independent voters. They can't all, you know, be on the Looney Tunes, right? Um, so I think that that um, having a two-party system in your community is probably the most important thing. What worries me the most about California is we have we have a one party system and and when I talk to my friends who are the last moderate Democrats, what they'll they'll say is I don't worry about the right in California. I worry about the left. I worry about a challenger to my left. I don't worry about losing to a more conservative Republican. So the 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 key thing is how do we restore a two party system? And I, I just not that I should give advice to conservatives um, uh, that they don't want, but you know, you can't run the John Coxes of the world. You can't run mini Trumps and hope to win in California. You got to be something else. You got to, you got to have a, a moderate conservatism that's practical, um, that maybe independents and some Democrats will vote for. Well, thank you very much. And okay. uh, you know, as a libertarian, I often tell both liberals and conservatives what they should do. So, uh, so th thank you very much for being with us. Uh, say it is a great book. I, I did misspeak. It is, it is out. Uh, but it, people should definitely read it. It's, it's, it's an excellent book. Uh, the, and uh, we're glad you could be with us today. We're going to move right into our next speaker, uh, Matt Zwolinski, uh, who's going to deliver our closing address today. Matt, a longtime friend of mine, is, is specializes in political philosophy and applied ethics. Uh, at San Di at the University of San Diego. He's the director of the university's Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy. Uh, he's the editor of Arguing About Political Philosophy and is currently writing or editing four books, so he is definitely prolific, if nothing else. Uh, and uh, I have to give him uh, a special uh, plug because he blurbed my book, so, uh, so I got to give him credit for that. Uh, anyway, Matt, take it away. Thank you, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank uh, the Cato Institute, and especially Mike Tanner in particular, for organizing this. And uh, and by this, I mean not just this conference, but really this entire project on poverty and inequality in California. Um, 
like Mike said, we've, we've been friends for a long time. I've been a fan of uh, Mike's work for a long time. Uh, I think his book on the inclusive economy is is absolutely terrific. And for those of you out there who haven't read it already, I, I really do highly recommend it. I, I didn't get paid for that blurb. It was, uh, <laughs> it was from the heart. Uh, Mike, one of the things I really admire about Mike's work, I think, is, is the fact that he's done more than just about anybody I know to really build bridges between people who see the world in very different ways and uh, to use those bridges to bring people together, not just to talk and to share ideas, but to really make real meaningful differences in the world. Uh, and so I've, I've just been delighted to listen to the other really fantastic and diverse speakers at this conference. And, uh, and I'm really honored to play some small role in it uh, myself. So, so thank you for that. Uh, so about 10 years ago, uh, I started a blog with uh, a few other academic philosophers and economists. Uh, all of us were libertarians of one sort or another. I think all, all five, we were, we were like the five libertarians in uh, higher education. Um, we all had strong appreciations for the virtues of free markets, uh, and we all had a healthy skepticism of government power, uh, but none of us were exactly dogmatists, uh, we thought at least. <laughs> we all recognized that the critics of libertarianism had some good points. Uh, and in particular, we took seriously in a way that some other libertarians seem not to, the idea of social justice. The idea that is that when you're evaluating a society, you ought to judge it at least in part from the perspective of the poor, the marginalized, and the oppressed. Um, that what matters is not merely how wealthy a society is or what kind of opportunities are open to its average citizens, but whether the wealth and opportunity of society are genuinely open to all. So we wanted to come up with a name for the blog that we hoped would convey that idea in a relatively pithy way. And uh, after a bit of back and forth, we eventually settled on the name Bleeding Heart Libertarians. Uh, and the motto of the blog was free markets and social justice. So I'm telling you the story today because I think there's an important idea here about how we might go about building a more inclusive economy for California. Uh, too often, I think, we approach political issues with what you might call a zero-sum mentality. Uh, there are two sides to the issue, and one side can only win if the other side loses. So. Pick your side and get in line. You're either conservative or a liberal. You're either for free markets or big government. You're either for freedom or for equality, but you can't, you can't possibly be for both. Except it turns out that on a lot of issues, and I think indeed on some of the most important issues facing Californians today, you can't. The supposed conflict between free markets and social justice is largely not entirely, but largely a myth. And it's a myth, I think, that's built upon an even deeper myth. The myth that what government regulation is really all about is helping the poor. Now, if you believe that myth, you're gonna think that if you support the poor, you gotta support government regulation. And if you're opposed to government regulation, well, then you're really opposed to helping the poor. But as I wanna show in the remainder of my talk, that's often simply a mistake. And it's a pernicious mistake that undermines our ability to work together across ideological lines to address urgent social problems in an efficient, humane, and liberating way. So I wanna talk about two examples from the world of public policy to illustrate my point. And I'll start with what is probably the most obvious example of this phenomenon and one that's already come up several times at this conference, and that is the phenomenon of housing regulation. Now, everybody knows how expensive it is to buy a home in California, but a lot of people, in my experience, with my students and talking about this with members of the general public, a lot of people think that's just because California is a really nice place to live, <laughs> which of course it is. Uh, I'm a California native. I've lived here all my life, apart from a brief stint in Arizona for graduate school, and uh, it's a really nice place. A lot of people want to live here. There's only so much land to go around, and so, it stands to reason, sort of, that it's more expensive to buy a house here than it is in all those other dreary, wet, gray states in the nation. Uh, but of course, as flattering as that story might be to our egos, it's far from the whole truth. The more important truth is that housing is expensive in California because we choose to make it so. 
And we choose to make it so because let's face it, it serves the financial self-interest of the people who already own homes in California for the housing prices to continue to rise. Speaking as a California homeowner myself, uh, I admit there is a not so small part of me that has enjoyed watching my house price shoot up on Zillow over this last year. Uh, like a lot of Californians, I view my house not just as a place to live, but as a kind of investment. And like any investment, I like to see it appreciate over time. But look, as a policymaker, you can't have it both ways. You cannot promote policies that lead to home prices going up and up every year and simultaneously promote policies that make housing affordable to everyone. This really is one of those cases where constrained by the laws of economics, you do have to choose one or the other. And I'm gonna let you guess which horn of that dilemma policymakers are gonna choose just about every time. If you've gotta choose between protecting the interests of people who own homes in California and who vote, and the interests of people who might like to own a home in California, but who can't afford to live here, simple political survival dictates that you're going to choose the former group just about every time. And so we're left with policies that make it easy for neighborhoods to veto new apartment complexes, with policies that mandate setback, minimum parking spaces, keep the city low, and that put obstacle after obstacle after obstacle in front of new development. The result of this suite of policies, as a number of economists, urban planners, and other concerned observers have been recognizing for a long time now, has been a litany of disasters. So just to focus on a few of those disasters, instead of attracting workers to human capital hubs where opportunities for work and productivity multipliers are high, restrictive zoning drives workers away. According, and just to flesh that out, according to one estimate by Enrico Moretti working with Sheng Tai She at the University of Chicago, two of the three worst offenders in restrictive land use and regulations in the entire United States are right here in California, San Francisco and San Jose. The third one's New York City. What they found was if regulatory barriers to new housing construction in just those three cities had been pared back to just the median national level, the resulting influx of workers and the increase in labor mobility would have raised overall U.S. output by 9.7%. And just to be sure that you heard that correctly, because it's kind of hard to believe, that's an increase in overall U.S. economic output of almost 10% just from loosening housing restrictions in three cities. Restrictive zoning makes it harder for workers to go where the jobs are and thereby acts as a massive, massive drag on economic growth. But it's worse than just this. Restrictive zoning not only slows growth, it also exacerbates economic and social inequalities. Zoning laws work by keeping poor people away from rich people, and often to keep people of color away from whites. Through explicit racial zoning in the past, and through policies that price minorities out of desirable neighborhoods today, these policies prevent people of color from building equity and appreciating homes, thus exacerbating the racial wealth gap. And because public schools are linked to neighborhoods, they also worsen educational inequality, which in turn feeds back into greater inequality of wealth and income in the future. But this means our housing policies perpetuate ethnic and socioeconomic disadvantage from one generation to the next over and over again. So what we have here in the case of housing policy is a clear cut case where moving in the direction of freer markets, cutting down on government regulation, allowing people to build on the land that they already own, would at the same time be a move in the direction of social justice. Current housing policy benefits relatively well off homeowners at the expense of those who are too poor to afford a home. And it does this not by accident, but by design. So what we have here, I want to argue, is not a zero-sum choice between freedom and fairness. This is a case where we could actually have both, but in fact, actually have neither. Here's another one. Like all states, California places restrictions on who can do what kind of work. In order to practice law or medicine or even drive a taxi or work as a cosmetologist, you need to get permission from the government. 
But while every state has occupational licensing requirements of some sort, California stands out uh, in the way that usually California stands out, right? And being one of the worst at something uh, in both the number of occupations it licenses and the extensiveness of the requirements that it must be met in order to obtain a license. Now, you've already heard a great overview of the problems of occupational licensing from Anastasia, uh, who's really done a lot of terrific work with this in the Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, and what I'm going to say here is going to repeat some of the points that she's already made, but it's such a tremendous and in some ways just unbelievable problem that I think a lot of these points bear repeating. So here's one. In 2015, more than one in five working Californians, that's 20.7 percent of the state's workforce, required a license from the government in order to do their jobs. One in five Californians required a license from the government in order to do their jobs. Among 76 low to moderate income occupations, so we're focusing on the bottom end of the, uh, of the economic distribution here, the average aspiring worker is required to spend 827 days in training and to pay $486 in fees before they're allowed to start even day one on the job. Now, I teach this stuff every semester in class and students are always shocked, but students quickly recover from their shock and say, well, look, of course, we need this, right? I mean, we need occupational licensing in order to protect the public safety, right? Protect consumers, protect public safety. When you've gotten a medical emergency and the EMTs show up at your door, you want to make sure that those people have been properly trained and that they're competent to do what's really a very demanding job. But as Anastasia pointed out, public safety just doesn't explain what's going on with occupational licensing here in California or elsewhere in the nations too. Cosmetologists are currently required to undergo 10 times as many months as trainings as EMTs. Commercial door repair contractors in California are required to undergo 39 times as much training as EMTs. And I seriously doubt, maybe you can prove me wrong on this, but I seriously doubt that our commercial door operators here in California are really that much safer than the door repair people in the 26 other states that don't require a license for that profession at all. Uh, and really, we don't have to speculate about this. There are a large number of academic studies now that have found that the connection between occupational licensing and consumer safety or product quality is either thin at best or non-existent at worst. Occupational licensing simply doesn't seem to make consumers any better off, but it does succeed in raising prices and enriching already established members of the licensed profession. It also succeeds, of course, in making it harder for people to find work, especially lower skilled, lower educated populations, immigrants, people with criminal records, people who move frequently, such as military spouses. Uh, most studies also find that licensure has a disproportionately negative impact on racial minorities. And like housing policy, Licensing is a policy that not only slows down economic growth, but increases economic inequality as well. Uh, it slows down economic growth largely by hindering the market's ability to match skilled labor to consumer demand. We have different licensing requirements, right, between different states. That makes it really hard to move from one state to another because you have to start this licensing process all over again, probably from day one. One study estimated that up to 36 there's a, up to 36 percent reduction in labor mobility that's attributable just to occupational licensing laws. And again, like housing policy, the cumulative cost of this policy can be just absolutely staggering. Uh, so, a couple of economists, Janet Johnson and Morris Kleiner, estimated that California licensing has cost almost 196,000 jobs annually. That has resulted in over 840 million in lost annual output. Uh, and that it's created, here's the really staggering number, it's created over $22 billion in annual costs through the misallocation of labor and other resources, right? We're just not using labor and other resources as efficiently as we could to meet consumer demand, and those opportunity costs really start to add up. So two different public policy areas, housing, occupational licensing, both of them defy what I call the usual zero-sum logic of politics, which tells us that we face a trade-off between strong economic growth on the one hand and an equitable, inclusive economy on the other hand. The usual logic is, look, either we slash regulation and we let the market rip, and that gets us rapid economic growth, 
or we clamp down on the market, regulate and redistribute more heavily, and that reduces inequality and broadens opportunity, but slows down economic growth. These two policy areas, and I would argue these are just two of many, show that it's possible to get the worst of both worlds. Uh, both these policies create a massive drag on economic growth, while at the same time making our economy less inclusive and more unequal. And they aren't just flukes. It's not just that we got really unlucky or that our policymakers don't know what they're doing. Quite the contrary. Our policymakers know exactly what they're doing. And in most cases, our policymakers are responding perfectly rationally to the incentives generated by the rules of electoral politics. Those rules dictate that if you want to stay on office, if you want to raise money for re-election, if you want to win support from other policy makers for your own pet policies, you've got to play the game of rent seeking, which means you've got to support the interests of the people who bring you the money and the votes, even if that's bad for the economy as a whole, which it usually is, and even if it's particularly bad, which it usually is, for the poorest and most vulnerable members of that economy. So where does that leave us? Well, on the one hand, the news is very bad. We here in California have a lot of policies that are bad from both a conservative and a liberal perspective. They're bad for both economic growth and for inclusion and equity. From a menu of trade-offs between costs and benefits, we've chosen an order that consists of all costs and no benefits. That's the bad news. The good news is, well, it's the good news you can give anyone who's hit rock bottom, which is there's nowhere to go but up. Um, but more seriously, the good news is that I think we're living through a time of political realignment, a time where what it means to be a Democrat or a Republican, a liberal or a conservative, is changing. And with that realignment comes an opportunity, I think, an opportunity to rethink some of the oppositions that we've taken for granted in our political life. For too long, we've simply assumed that a libertarian or conservative appreciation for free markets can't be reconciled with a progressive concern for social justice, that you've got to pick one or the other. But maybe now is a good time to rethink that assumption. But creating good policy is hard enough without making it even harder on ourselves by self-imposing these dichotomous ideological identities and refusing to work with or even listen to anybody who doesn't belong to the same team. If we could start to tear those ideological barriers down, then we could start to work together to make real change, to improve the transparency of political decision-making, to make rent-seeking more difficult, to think in innovative ways about how to create win-win policies that promote economic growth and greater equity. And to once again make California a place that welcomes innovation, entrepreneurship, and creativity, not just from a select few, but from anyone with the courage and the grit to give it a shot. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm glad you went last because I would not have wanted everyone else to have to follow that. No. <laughs> uh, terrific, terrific set of remarks. And I do want to associate myself with the, the tenor of them and the idea that we can do well while doing good, so to speak, on these things. But and I, actually, that brings me into kind of the opening question that I have for you, which is kind of a broad one. You're an ethicist and a philosopher. Uh, so taking the, that into account, what should be the purpose of public policy? I don't think there's just one. Uh, I think uh, we, as, as an ethicist uh, and, and, a, and a political philosopher, one of the things you learn fairly quickly, I think, or that you should learn fairly quickly in, in those lines of work is that uh, any, any theoretical attempt to reduce complex phenomena to just one thing, right? It's really all about maximizing utility, or it's really all about respecting individual liberty, um, is ultimately going to be bound to fail. Um, there are a lot of things that we care about uh, as human beings uh, in our own individual lives. 
there are a lot of things that we care about uh, as human beings living in political community with one another. Uh, and so the nature of ethics or the uh, purpose of public policy, I think, is going to be um, correspondingly uh, multifaceted. So for instance, I think you know, you know people who, who care about economic growth are absolutely onto something, right? Uh, economic growth matters a lot. Uh, it matters a lot partly because it makes our lives uh, more comfortable. Um, it's nice to have nice things. It's nice to have air conditioning. It's nice to have um, clean drinking water and indoor plumbing. And those are all great comforts that economic growth has given us. Um, but economic growth is also important because it ties into other things that we care about. It ties into, for instance, our sense of meaning uh, and purpose in life. Uh, work is not, after all, just about earning money so that you can buy uh, those things that give you comfort. Uh, work is part of uh, how we find meaning and purpose and community in our lives. Uh, it's not the only way that we can find meaning and purpose and community in our lives. There are people who, who don't work, who, who stay at home and you know, don't work in the paid labor market anyways, but who stay at home and um, take care of a, a, a family, for instance, um, who can find meaning in other ways. But work is, for a lot of people, the main source of meaning and purpose in their lives. Uh, and so policies that make it hard for people to work, that make it hard for people to do the kind of work that gives them meaning, right? Uh, not every job is necessarily going to be equal, equally meaningful to every person. Um, those kinds of policies are going to be bad, not just from a kind of perspective of, oh, we're slowing down aggregate economic growth. Um, they're going to be bad because they, they make it, they, they're, they're alienating to people, right? They're deeply alienating to people. And I think as we've seen over the last four or five years uh, in America, uh, this sense of alienation, the sense of not belonging, of not fitting in, of not having a purpose and a place in the world um, can be very destructive. Uh, it can be destructive on an individual level to your personal health in terms of you know, where you're driven to, in terms of drug uh, and alcohol use to, to cope with that lack of meaning. Uh, and it can be very destructive socially and politically, I think, as well. Um, so sorry, you asked a philosopher uh, 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 a big a big question, and and uh, the an the answer is is big too. There's there's a lot of things uh, that are linked together in in complicated kind of ways, and uh, uh, the the tricky business of public policy is is a way of is 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 finding a way to balance those competing values in a way that uh, that makes sense. Well, let me force you out of academia for a minute there. Having given you the academic question, uh, let me bring you into the more political or practical world. So I'm all not right. sure they're the same thing at all. <laughs> on that, but, but one of the recurring themes of this conference has been this power differential uh, idea. The idea that we have elites who make the rules and then sort of powerless, uh, marginalized communities that, uh, that have to live with them and are generally hurt by them whether you call this feudalism, as Joel was just talking about, or structural racism, uh, which you can see given the history of many of these rules and regulations from zoning to occupational licensing and so on. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you call it, but what you have is the group of people who just don't have the power to overcome the, the elites. How can, you know, how can we win this fight? How do you put together a coalition of the powerless, so to speak, and who can take on the entrenched special interests, the teachers unions, the politicians in Sacramento, the wealthy suburban homeowners that, well, you see Robert Reich arguing against zoning law, you know, re relaxing zoning laws uh, right alongside uh, the most conservative, the hardcore Trumpians out there. So how, how do you how do you take that on? Yeah, I've, I believe me, I have listened with great interest to the answers that uh, the other speakers at this conference have given to that question as you've as you've posed it to them. And uh, and it, it, there's been some great ideas, uh, but it's it's a really hard question. Um, it's one thing for an academic economist or philosopher to point to a public policy and say, here's the problem with what you're doing. And here's here's something else that you could be doing that would make a lot more sense. Uh, it's quite another thing to take that good idea and get it implemented in public policy, especially if, as I said, policymakers are responding rationally to the incentives that the political system creates for them. Uh, so how how do you change that system in a way that 
um, that undermines rent seeking, right? And that that makes uh, policymakers more responsive to the interests of the whole community and not merely the interests of a, a narrow portion of that community. Uh, there are there are things you can try, right? I'm not I'm not optimistic uh, enough to say like here's a foolproof solution that's definitely going to solve the problem, but there are, there are things we can do that move stuff in the right direction, right? So um, the more information people have, the better, right? The more people know about these policies, the better. Uh, the more we can teach about this in colleges, the more public awareness there is of the way these policies work, the better. Uh, the more we can strengthen relatively impartial areas of government, like at the federal level, the Government Accountability Office, um, or the Office of Management and Budget uh, to provide impartial analyses of the effects and redistributive nature of different kinds of public policy, um, the better. Uh, Cass Sunstein and Ed Glazer, right, a kind of liberal libertarian pair, um, argued for extending central review of regulation under the Office of Management and Budget, not just to the, from the federal level, but all the way through the states. Um, that's something that I think has some some merit too. Uh, so that's one kind of approach. I think um, shifting decision making venues when we can. Uh, so this is an idea that uh, Brink Lindsay and Stephen Tellis, uh, two people I know you know quite well, uh, talk about in a recent book of theirs called The Captured Economy, which is a really excellent analysis of both the problem of rent seeking and different kinds of solutions to it. Uh, and one of the solutions they talk about in that book is shifting decision-making venues, right? So that um, decisions about public policy are made in forums that are relatively unbiased and relatively open to input from a variety of different sources. So if we're talking about education reform, for instance, there's a big difference between having schools made schools, which are easily manipulated by and captured by powerful special interests like the teachers unions, from having it there or from having it under mayoral control, which is still not perfect, but which at least allows for a broader range of voices to be heard. It's less uh, easy for special interests to capture and manipulate the decision-making process to suit their own ends. So that kind of shifting, zoning decisions, right? Zoning decisions are made at the local level almost exclusively now. If we can move it away from the local level, move it towards the state level, um, or the municipal, uh, sort of county level at least, uh, anything, you know, so the broader the interest groups that you have to take into account in making your decision, the less likely that any one particular interest group is gonna dominate that decision making. Um, there might also, I don't know, this is maybe more speculative, um, but there might also be a, a role to be played by kind of an expanded vision of judicial review um, at some point in the future. Um, for, for almost a century now, uh, the Supreme Court has been very, very hesitant to um, overturn any kind of economic regulations passed by Congress. Basically, as long as some somebody somewhere can come up with some half-assed sounding idea of why this might be a good idea, the Supreme Court's going to defer to Congress. Um, if we can change that, uh, and that means going back to something like the much maligned Lochner area, or, era, or at least something in that direction. If we can give the Supreme Court um, and and uh, and lower courts a greater role in reviewing economic regulation, I think that would do a lot. And I think there's good philosophical and political rationale for doing that. Um, you know, economic liberty matters to people, uh, and and a lot of our jurisprudence is based on what I think is a very misleading idea that there's this hierarchy of liberties, right? Civil liberties are way up here. Those are super, super important. Economic liberties, those are kind of down here. They're not, they're not that important. I don't think that's well grounded. And I think if we can elevate economic liberties to something like where civil liberties are uh, and treat them with the same deference and respect, um, that that would go some distance towards solving a lot of the problems we face with not just over regulation, but uh, pernicious and um, um, inefficient and uh, regressively redistributive regulation. Well, thank you. I'm going to give you one minute here to answer to John's question uh, from the virtual platform to give you a chance to clarify something. Uh, you're not saying that training per se is bad. Uh, you know, you you want your EMTs trained. Uh, that's not what you're talking about when you're talking about occupational licensing, right? 
Got about one no, minute here, right? So occupational licensing means getting it. You need to have a license from the government in order to um, to perform your job, meaning that the government is going to decide what kind of training everybody needs and not allow anybody who doesn't have the training it thinks they need uh, to perform a job. Uh, that, I think, is generally a bad idea. Uh, but of course, training itself is a great idea. And there are a lot of professions uh, in the United States that are licensed in some states and not licensed in others. And that doesn't mean that the people who are getting, who are practicing that profession in the license in the states where they're not licensed aren't getting trained. They're getting trained. Consumers want them to be trained. Um, and employers, the people who are going to be hiring these people, want employees who know what they're doing. So there are already lots of incentives just in the marketplace for people to acquire adequate training. The problem, I think, is when you politicize that process. Um, that's where um, the rent seeking comes in. That's where you know you restrict the supply, you increase uh, the wealth of a small class, and you make everybody else just generally speaking worse off. Well, thank you, Matt. Really appreciate uh, your being here tonight and helping to close this out. Uh, I want to thank everybody who attended today's uh, conference on after COVID, building an inclusive economy for California. Uh, recordings of this event will be uh, available on our Cato website shortly after the event's conclusion, so you can watch it again. Uh, every bit is good the second time through, I want to tell you. Uh, but if your friends and neighbors and coworkers haven't seen it, uh, they can watch it as well. I hope people will uh, pass news of this around. Uh, also hope that you will stay on for the uh, roundtable discussions that are taking place. If you're on the main event platform, uh, you will have uh, you have three different discussion groups, one on social justice, one on nationwide perspectives, and one on economic inclusion. And I hope you'll go to those and you can continue the discussion and uh, networking there. Uh, finally, I just want to make take a moment to thank several people who have helped make this possible. Mackenzie Johnson and the entire conference staff, they have been absolutely incredible in making all this work. It, it's no easy feet to put all the moving parts together, and I couldn't be more grateful for them. Also, my two assistants, uh, Kelly Lester and, uh, and David Hervey, uh, they're the project assistants on this. They're working not just this conference, but the entire Cato project on poverty and inequality in California. They are terrific. Uh, every day I have some new demand on them, and they get it done. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, uh, who, of course, none of this would be possible without them. So thank you to all of our Cato sponsors who make these things possible. Uh, the project is ongoing. Uh, our next conference will be October 21st in Sacramento, hopefully live. Uh, if the state continues to open up, I hope to be there. And before that, I hope to be coming back to California and an opportunity to meet with many of you. So you'll be hearing from me, I'm sure. We're also going to continue to do a series of many seminars and many uh, video events. I'm uh, so talking about a variety of project of topics. Uh, education, criminal justice are coming, some of the things that are coming to mind. Uh, they'll be coming up shortly. And uh, I want to thank you all for that. And finally, I guess we're going to leave you with this last video. Uh, thank you all again for coming. Thank you.